नमस्कार वेलकम टू दिस पोस्ट लंच सेशन द टाइटल थीम ऑफ द सेशन इज आयुर्वेद फॉर ह्यूमैनिटी पर्सन सेंट्रिक अप्रोच द फर्स्ट स्पीकर इज डॉक्टर भावना प्राशर शी इज प्रिंसिपल साइंटिस्ट सी एस आई आर त्रिसूत्र आयुर्जेनोमिक्स यूनिट न्यू डेली आई जस्ट रीड हर ब्रीफ इंट्रोडक्शन डॉक्टर भावना पराशर शी वॉज अपॉइंटेड इन एज प्रिंसिपल साइंटिस्ट इन सी एस आर आर त्रिसूत्र यूनिट एज प्रिंसिपल इन्वेस्टिगेटर सेंटर ऑफ एक्सीलेंस फॉर अप्लाइड डिवेलपमेंट ऑफ आयुर्वेद प्रकृति एंड जेनोमिक्स एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर academic academy of scientific and innovative research she has pioneered in the establishment of new field of ayur genomics that aims to integrate principles of ayurveda with genomics for personalized and preventive medicine since its inception in 2002 her group has for the first time provided molecular and genomic basis to the principles of prakriti and using ml based approaches recapitulated the basis of prakriti assessment these have propelled biomarker discoveries which have enabled its global acceptance she has more than 22 years of experience post md and 4 years of clinical experience as practitioner of ayurveda at vedanta ayurveda new delhi 19 years of research experience at CSIR from 2001 till date her areas of expertise include understanding of trisutra ayurveda application of clinical methods development of methods for clinical evaluation of prakriti etc and the topic of her presentation today will be Pro proactive and personalized approach of ayurveda towards health and medicine dr bhavana the floor is for you now dr bhavana prashant please uh, thank you uh, very much for your kind words uh, uh, ma'am and uh, i really uh, thank uh, dr ram manohar and the entire organizing uh, team uh, vif ris as well as iiam uh, for this wonderful opportunity to speak before the uh, uh, learned audience on uh, this topic which is very dear to our hearts uh, uh, pro proactive and personalized i have used two words here uh, one is uh, proactive and another is personalized by proactive we will uh, get to uh, the whole thing uh, in a due course of uh, during my uh, presentation and uh, personalized we all understand that ayurveda and, and traditional systems of medicine ha, are extremely personalized at the same time hol holistic in nature so uh, uh, to tell why it is how it is proactive and not proactive only from the individual's point of view but it is also proactive in uh, uh, in you know putting a vigil over what is in the surrounding how we are uh, interacting with the environment and how we are uh, actually taking care of the environment so it is proactive in both individualized as well as ecosystem wise and that's the beauty part of ayurveda's uh, system uh, which is uh, you know, thousands of years old so as we all know a health disease continuum uh has a, a healthy state then sometimes somebody fa falls ill and is a pre disease state then there is disease onset the disease progresses and if it is not taken care properly it progresses to the complication stage but uh, the not that every individual and uh, who experiences the a given disease goes through the same process in a same manner there are lots of variabilities different 
in the presentation in uh, which uh, people present with health as well as the disease and also there are differences in how the healthcare outcomes are also observed so this has very compellingly you know, told even the modern medicine there is a very uh, uh, pressing need for predictive approaches in medicine and thereby doing prevention and, and this involves two things identification of high risk groups for disease susceptibility and adverse drug response what does ayurveda has to say ayurveda's uh, whole subject matter is in the form of three sutra three sutra means hetu lakshana and aushada which means the causes the features and the therapy everything has been linked together in a manner that is having actionability it's not just theoretical or it is not just philosophical there is a clear cut uh, uh, statement that this is fully actionable thing that we are talking about over here so when the, when we say lakshana or linga it is called you can say that it defines health and diseases it's not just talking about a mission statement that we want to restore health and we want to uh, alleviate the disease but it actually gives different definitions and definitions not only in terms of uh, as we will go along the presentation i will show how it is not just showing what it will look like to be healthy but what it would biologically mi um, uh, minimally require in an internal system to be displaying the features of health so what will that entail uh, is also so that comprehensive biological systemic definition of health is also something given thousands of years back which we are even lacking today as a comprehensive definition of health uh, even in this uh, modern times when we say hetu it tells about the knowledge of determinants of health determinants of health not for an individual alone or only from the external manifestation external factors point of view like diet lifestyle stress and all but also the internal factors of uh, determine which determine health and the functioning of the body in a healthy manner so this actually lays a foundation for one health concept that we are talking about here hetus are related to external environmental factors as well as internal and their interaction and this this expands further up to social emotional and climatic uh, variables everything comes under this hetu category and uh, there are dedicated chapters for all different aspects of hetu also similarly aushada is is not just um, uh, dealing from internal pathological understanding of the disease it it is actually always connected to hetu as well as lakshana so it is an actionable interventions matching with all the health variability as well as disease variability so when they say tri sutra hetu lakshana and aushada comprises of ayurveda and it has all clinical applications of uh preventive medicine predictive medicine personalized medicine as we are now seeking out it also has research applications in terms of uh if they are systematically unfolded and explored they, uh, and that too if they are um, taken along with the modern technology uh, one can actually go about finding out novel discoveries of Uh, biomarkers which are decipherable by modern techniques novel therapies and repurposing of the new uh, 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 medicine uh, old medicines for the new indications so this whole thing is uh, very 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 systematically documented and uh, as i said health is not just defined on the basis of physical mental social emotional or spiritual well being it is also uh, actually described in terms of what it would mean to be in a state of well being so uh, bottom here there is a clinical definition of health given by charak sanghita and here there is a biological uh, biological system level health definition which has been given as to what would be minimally required 
for a human being to display a good health features so so it tells that there's there was a lot of uh, in-depth understanding of the human physiological systems uh, in the ancient times and not merely an external observation based uh, uh, as many a times it is uh, uh, propelled uh, i mean uh, uh, told so it, and it it also goes about not just as a static one time feature uh, uh, health description, but it also gives different contours and different uh, levels of health that a person may enjoy. And one of the uh, thing is Vyadik uh, Shamatva, which is called as uh, immunity, or which we generally believe as immunity, but it is Vyadik Shamatva in general which is called as uh, the, the tolerance or the robustness or resilience in your health uh, system or a, uh, that, that what, how, what kind of features a person will uh, have if we were, one were to say that, okay, this person is going to be extremely robust in terms of Vyadik Shamatva. So those kind of features, so it's, it, these are levels of health, not just health in, in terms of absence of disease or merely a vague description of well-being, but they, uh, there are different levels of health described and they are not just described for the sake of observation and this one, they have given measures to achieve them also. Similarly, conversely, what, a, what is the sign of a... Uh, 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 or what are the features of people who are more vulnerable to uh, system, so vulnerability of systemic health? So important considerations in designing the preventive interventions. So uh, without getting too much into the individual details, this only tells that health is not just one kind of a one dimensional thing that has been described. It has been described in several uh, uh, stages and in several contours. And, and then they say that what determines health, as they say, then uh, inter-individual, what determines variability in health. So whether everybody would have this, even if two persons are healthy, are they going to be this healthy in the same way? Are they going to display the same kinds of uh, health features? And even if they display the same kind of health features, Will they always remain same in response to changing environment or in, in response to the emergent conditions? So they they ascribe all of it to Vat and Kapha, which are like three functional entities of the body grouped into three categories. And if they are in the balanced state, the health is enjoyed throughout. But if they are uh, somewhat tilted towards one side or the other, uh, even in that case, health is enjoyed normally, but they may have more susceptibility towards one kind of the derangements versus the other. So that calls for a personalized approach in even management of health. Not, not uh, We are not even reached the disease state, even if we are in the healthy state, what kind of variations need to be brought about to forever remain in that healthy state. So this is a personalized approach where you not only look at the disease, uh, uh, not only look at the disease, to look at the disease itself is a very big thing. There are different stages. There are different pathophysiological stages that are to be taken care of, onset, subtype, staging, severity. Mm -hmm. uh, we all understand that from even the modern medicine point of view. But Ayurveda talks about understanding an individual also and the baseline individual also again from both uh, by baseline strength point of view and how much it has got affected finally by the disease at this current state is also to be uh, seen. So uh, may I request if there is somebody speaking uh, to please uh, mute yourself, uh, it's causing little disturbance. Yeah, and matching with this disease and individual variability, there are medicines prescribed, and these medicines uh, are not only prescribed from the point of view of actual difference in their medicine, they can be variability in many ways to make it much more suitable for an individual. So all throughout uh, this uh, disease, individual as well as drugs, environment, there's a common thread running uh, across, it's called Tridosha. 
and if they uh, as uh, you already heard dr rama speaking about it i will i am just taking you through to tell that how this tridosha can actually provide a window into connecting it with the modern uh, technological and modern parameters based analysis so if the common organizing principle are tridosha which talk through features which talk through the environment which talk through the medicine if they remain within the homeostatic state they are the prakriti or the health is enjoyed if they are part of a disease can happen and the therapy aims to bring the back bring it back to the healthy states and uh, these uh, these have been pictorially shown over here the yellow triangle over here shows that these are the three doshas proportions that you may be born with uh, and then uh, due to diet lifestyle environment season age fluctuations in three dosha happen and that will remain within the adaptive space uh, health is still enjoyed but if it goes beyond a threshold of adaptive space uh, people can enter into disease zone and the restoration of tridosha levels after the treatment can bring back the health so th there is a opportunity for understanding tridosha at a molecular level or at a uh, pro and to uh, devise proactive preventive therapies for individuals Uh, one needs to understand the prakriti of the individual, and that's what is uh, forming the basis for. Uh, so why, why, how is prakriti important? Because prakriti, if it is uh, uh, there right from tridosha proportions, if they are right there from the time of birth, they actually determine the whole system development as well as physiological pattern development, which reflects in the form of. the yeah. way we are built the way we are programmed the way we are functioning and the way we are responding to the external environment and this gets manifested in the form of uh, structure uh, function uh, behavioral patterns as well as the responsiveness to environment and this uh, this has all been shown again uh, by in different context uh, showing uh, not just mentioning it at one corner of the uh, textbook every place they are again and again showing that even if there is a replenishment of dhatus happening because of uh, after eating food every day also the patterns of replenishment also are followed as per the prakriti similarly the uh, uh, even the example of blood they are saying that different individuals even if they are healthy they might display slightly different characteristics or related to blood with like bleeding time Uh, clotting time thickness of blood these small variabilities can actually be seen and if these variabilities are, are matched with the corresponding diet and lifestyle it health is enjoyed or uh, if it is going in the same direction as there is dominance of dosha in prakriti it may result into over expression of those doshas in their systems which might cause uh, diseases related to those doshas like in case of pitta they have said that ushma adhikam or bleeding uh, kind of tendencies are higher in pitta individuals whereas uh, accumulation growth uh, uh, too much of uh, uh, fats uh, obesity Uh, even atherosclerotic like conditions they can go up in case of kapha individuals so accordingly they have asked for diet and lifestyle recommendations for maintenance of health because uh, this might actually show up their disease susceptibilities so what we are trying to look at or, or what we thought of is that if this prakriti is what determines the whole structure and function and response to environment which is coming because of vat pit and kaf can we or is there any way we can find out the molecular or genetic basis of vat pit and kaf and then explain all this variability uh, in in terms of modern parameters so what we uh, so this was a question with which we started in uh, igib Uh, 2002, and this is the approach that we took. That if we take normal, healthy individuals of a population, and if we classify them into prakriti types, the assumption is that their their clinical presentation of dosha prakriti 
is actually indicative of the dosha proportions inside their systems and if we were to look at their molecular physiological profiles and find out the difference between them we can we identify the molecular basis or genetic basis to uh, black pip and cuff so for that we actually started out with uh, prakriti stratification normal healthy individuals looked at, uh, of the same age group coming from the same geoclimatic condition uh, absolutely no variations uh, not too many variations in the diet before blood collection but we still find that vat versus pit versus cuff there are variations in the biochemical levels there are variations in the way they express their genes and these genes which come from different uh, biological processes are differing between uh, them so uh, uh, what, what 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 implication it might have is that whether these differences in expression patterns and biochemical levels of the genes whether they actually have any bearing on their future health profile or if they were to go to some other uh, environment or practice some other kind of uh, diet lifestyle they might actually end up having different outcomes of the disease uh, may i please uh, ask uh, uh, everybody else to mute because this is causing a lot of disturbance <laughs> So, uh, uh, amongst the genes which were showing differential expression in uh, in prakriti, we followed one of the gene which is responsible for oxygen sensing in the cell. So, cellular level oxygen sensor, if it shows uh, differences with respect to variability, uh, variability with respect to I think from the host side, the, the mic is still on, please, uh, if possible, yeah. Uh, so, so there is a difference between pit prakriti and kaf prakriti in the way uh, this gene's expression is different. So whether, and then we also looked at the DNA level differences and we found those uh, again the difference between cuff prakriti and pit prakriti so uh, just to tell you in a nutshell that higher expression linked genotype was high in cuff prakriti and low expression related genotypes were high in pit prakriti and this tells that pit prakriti and cuff prakriti will have a difference with respect to how they respond to oxygen uh, levels in the environment so this uh, this prompted us to look for whether the genetic variations that we are seeing, uh, do they have any bearing on how people would respond to high altitude conditions. So uh, we, we looked at the Indian populations who are residing in high altitude versus those who go from sea level to high altitude and they fall sick. So we've again found that people who fall sick, it is called as high altitude pulmonary edema their genotype frequency was similar to individuals of cuff prakriti and people who were natives and who had adapted well to the high altitude or uh, low oxygen hypoxic conditions their genotypes were similar to pitta the same thing we observed across world populations residing at different altitudes the particular genotype that we had observed uh, was uh, that was linked to pitta was more observed in people who were residing in high altitude across world populations and so uh, and uh, therefore we concluded that this particular genotype has which is linked to pitta prakriti has a more adaptive potential in high altitude hypoxic condition so this was a, <clears throat> a new discovery not only that we showed something which was known in modern literature to be associated with pitta prakriti or kaf prakriti but through this, we actually could discover a novel, molecule, novel genetic marker, which went on to be shown as important for high altitude adaptation. So this told that this Prakriti method can also allow us to identify new genetic markers, which can be useful for predictive medicine in general. 
So likewise, we went about doing for other markers and this tells that this whole system of Ayurveda, which talks about uh, a personalized approach and looks at individuals from their Prakriti point of view, the individuals of different uh, contrasting Prakriti, which are of extreme Prakriti types. Uh, most of us are combined Prakriti, uh, Vat, Pet, Pitvat, but uh, uh, few people are of a dominant Prakriti and those dominant Prakritis can actually lead, could lead us to identify uh, genetic variations uh, underlying them. And the genetic variations were not just random genetic variations, they were coming from certain biological, uh, in biologically important processes. And one of the genetic variation we followed was also found, uh, gave us the genetic marker. Now, whether this particular thing is also relevant for some disease condition, one of our colleague also went on to show that this EGLN1 gene also, if it is inhibited um, in asthma mouse model, it exacerbates asthma and that can give rise to severe asthma. So now the question is because we told about three sutra concept, can it be possible that now we go back to the medicine part and say that, okay, something which will balance pith and kapha, can that be useful in those asthma or maybe in the hypoxic conditions? So now uh, having understood the molecular basis of pith and cuff through Prakriti modeling, uh, we could identify, okay, this hypoxia is the axis which is important to differentiate between pith and cuff. And if we were to see any medical condition which involves hypoxia, an exaggeration of uh, pathological condition can arise because of that. The medicine can be useful in alleviating that kind of a condition. So one of the medicine that we worked on severe asthma is Adathoda Vasika described in Ayurveda uh, to be Pitta Kapha balancing. We saw its effect on inflammation, airway hyperresponsiveness, and it also gave us novel insights into its mechanistic uh, molecular mechanistic functioning. And that novel insight actually prompted us to look for its other applications in conditions uh, using mouse models uh, to see whether the, those conditions where hypoxia is relevant either as a cause or as a consequence can in those conditions Adhatroda Vasika can also be useful. So we tested it in pulmonary fibrosis model, sepsis model, we also tested it as hypoxia thrombo thrombosis model. And to just cut this long story short, we could also take it to the level that it can be repurposed for COVID-19 through proper investigation using conventional uh, <clears throat> modern scientific methods in vitro, in vivo, and in silico models. And uh, this only tells that uh, come integration of Ayurveda with uh, uh, modern medical techniques, it is amenable to that integration and it uh, inquiry and that further only potentiates the understanding about this medicines, uh, uh, mechanistic understanding at the system level, which can enable their repurposing for the new diseases and for the new indications. We have uh, uh, so taking uh, so this was a complete story in itself. But we have also gone about uh, seeing uh, 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 more differences using next generation sequencing methods like exome sequencing and all. Uh, we have gone on to look for more molecular markers underlying prakriti, and uh, we have earlier I showed it in North Indian population. Then we have went about doing it in. Western Indian population, we have went about doing in other Indian populations. This is again to show that even if when we do Prakriti analysis, irrespective of the geographical location, when we make those labels of Vat, Pit and Kaf, the common uh, molecular differences are clearly visible. And uh, application of this, I will just take uh, very quickly to this, that when we have looked at the Vat, Pit, Kaf, Prakriti individuals, at genetic level, what we first found was that uh, EGLN1 and VWF related genes, which is hypoxia and thrombosis associated uh, genetic variations were differing between pitta and kapha, wherein 
Kapha Prakriti individuals showed higher association with uh, high altitude pulmonary edema and thrombosis associated allele. Uh, uh, in, in this another study, when we looked at the markers related to drug response uh, markers, so uh, FDA has approved certain genetic markers to be tested before giving medicines, mo even modern medicines to patients. So out of those 28 uh, SNPs in 11 FDA approved drugs were differing between Pitt and Kaf Prakriti in one of our study that we published. And just give you one example that again over here, the one of the SNPs, uh, uh, one of the genetic variation between Pitt and Kaf showed that it requires a low dose of anticoagulant drug warfarin. So the SNP or a genetic variation associated with the lesser dose requirement of anticoagulant was more present in Pit Prakriti, showing that they would they so they would have a lower frequent a lower requirement of anticoagulant drugs. Here we had seen in cuff it was reverse. The thrombosis associated allele was uh, more present in cuff individuals. Another uh, uh, outcome of the next generation sequencing methodology, we found that there was another SN uh, genetic variation associated with Pitta, which had suggested that a higher coagulation inhibition in Pitta. So in general, uh, hemostasis or a bleeding axis, which I showed, uh, Ayurveda describes bleeding propensity in Pitt Prakriti. Uh, at genetic level, the uh, evidences also are converging to show that there is differential disease susceptibility. There is differential drug response converging uh, towards uh, evidence of personalized therapeutics possible by doing Prakriti assessment and along with the molecular marker. So these are more examples that we have published in uh, journal, uh, which show that certain modern medicine drugs, which are to be prescribed after giving, take, looking at the genetic variations, those genetic variations are actually partitioning differently between uh, individuals of Vat, Pitt and Kaf Prakriti, uh, telling us that normal uh, personalized approach of Ayurveda could help in modern medical and research settings to identify genetic biomarkers, genetic or biomarkers for disease predisposition and environmental responsiveness. It can also help identify subpopulation of individuals who could be more susceptible to adverse health conditions. It can identify genes corresponding to differential drug response even for modern medicine and thereby modern medicines can be prescribed based on personalized approach of Ayurveda through Prakriti assessment in near future. Integrative research on Ayurveda medicine with modern scientific parameters can enable mechanistic understanding of Ayurveda medicine and appreciate its multiple indications based on system pharmacology approach. And this can further lead to repurposing of Ayurveda medicines for new diseases and health conditions. And now this clinical method, having said this, that clinical methods of Ayurveda holds importance and it shows differences at molecular level. We are also showing differences at the cellular level by um, studying the cell lines of different Prakriti individuals where we see that baseline differences are also visible and in response to stress like UV radiation, hypoxia and heat, different Prakriti cell lines are responding differently. This tells about inter-individual variability at cellular level also and we have also gone about to show physiological level differences. So this tells that all these differences, uh, if they are there, uh, underlying differences, then measuring Prakriti in different age group people and keeping the context of Desh and Kal in mind, if we were to also analyze people's current lifestyle put together, if we were to identify the gaps uh, that are there in their lifestyle and accordingly recommend personalized and uh, health and wellness uh, related recommendations. This can actually be a very, very um, important model for preventive uh, and holistic well-being. So this is something which we uh, we have a privilege of integrating in Ayushman Bharat uh, 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 Ayush Health and Wellness Centers, this Prakriti methodology that we have developed at IGIB 
we are uh, we have trained people from across different states and uh, union territories uh, to uh, apply at different uh, health and wellness centers and we are training partners for ministry of ayush in uh, conducting that and we also provide uh, an, a web based support for um, quick analysis of prakriti and with this i would like to stop my presentation i would like to thank all of our uh, collaborators and interdisciplinary team and uh, we also uh, there was one question regarding uh, uh, how do we uh, kind of build practically interdisciplinary team so I just wanted to take a uh, uh, couple of minutes to tell you that we at CSIR IGIV we also run a PhD course in Ayur genomics where people students from different disciplines ayurveda modern medicine modern science physiology computational background statistics pharmacology have all joined uh, us uh, in uh, solving the question of ayurveda and genomics which is ayur genomics uh, for predictive and personalized medicine that is one thing we also uh, 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 have uh, many many such educational programs we have also conducted add-on course on ayurveda biology at delhi university uh, venkateshwar college they are also now integrating uh, offering this uh, trying to offer this elective on ayurveda biology in the nep program uh, at the university level uh, we uh, i have also been uh, involved in the uh, development of bsc msc five year integrated course uh, on ayurveda biology uh, at jawaharlal nehru university delhi and i am also glad to share with you that uh, national uh, ncism national commission for indian system of medicine has also now introduced elective courses on ayur genomics and ayur biology for the uh, ayush uh, undergraduate uh, uh, ayurveda unani all all stream uh, undergraduate colleges in addition to that, uh, I would also like to uh, apprise the um, uh, forum uh, that uh, some of the uh, modern medicine institutions also have developed certain uh, courses of, on Ayush related inter introductory courses for modern medical, uh, modern medicine students during their MBBS course. So I think a lot of uh, momentum has gathered around developing this interdisciplinary human resource. And uh, I'm happy to tell that we also have a lot, big consortium kind of a uh, network of uh, in, um, Ayurveda modern medicine, uh, genomics uh, collaborators. People are now coming together to do this kind of interdisciplinary work. And this whole thing within CSIR, within IGIB, as well as outside CSIR, multiple people uh, are coming together for this integrative uh, uh, initiative of uh, deciphering the modern scientific basis so basically this is to tell that uh, integrate ayurveda is absolutely amenable to integration with the modern and interoperability is quite possible and the machine learning that ma'am told about my introduction was that this Prakriti method that we have developed is on the basis of uh, Ayurveda's uh, uh, methodology, but we have applied uh, advanced machine learning algorithms to identify, to, to develop models for predictive, predictive models for Prakriti. And we have been system uh, successful in achieving that and we have also published papers. And we are integrating this, this system that I have showed uh, uh, of Prakriti analysis, it actually integrates those machine learning algorithms in uh, giving you the Prakriti analysis. So, uh, so personalized and proactive approach of Ayurveda is absolutely amenable to interdisciplinary research. And uh, there are lots of uh, possibilities uh, that uh, are there. So, uh, I thank you again very much for your patient listening. And uh, I will be happy to take any questions. I'm sorry, I think there is hardly any time for questions because we still have three more speakers this afternoon. So let the next speaker present his viewpoint and then we can have joint discussion. Okay. But thank you, Dr. Bhavna Prasher, yeah. for bringing out a new dimension to the Ayurveda theory of three sutra and presenting the future potential of it 
with integrating it with machine learning and other new approaches, also for offering courses in Ayurgenomics at various levels. I think that is the future course of Ayurveda. Thank you again. Thank you. Now I should invite Dr. M. Prasad, and he will present his paper on person-centric approach in Ayurveda, the same topic, but it is in a glimpse of Charaka Sanghita. So his dimension is different. Vaidya M. Prasad is a postgraduate practitioner with 27 years of clinical experience. He did his post-graduation in Shalakya Tantra from the prestigious government Ayurveda College, Tiruvananthapuram. Parallel to his regular studies, he learned the philosophy and fundamental principles of Ayurveda under the legendary Acharya Vaidya Bhushanam K. Raghavan Tirumpunupad for 21 years. In 2006, he started Sunitri Ayurveda Ashrama and research center in a remote village in the Thrissur district of Kerala. He was a regular teacher up to 2020 and headed an Ayurveda college as its principal for five years. Apart from his clinical services, currently he is serving as guru for the informal education program of Rajtriya Ayurveda Vidya Peet under the Ministry of Ayush, Government of India. He is working in the care of autistic kids since 2002 and developed an Ayurvedic protocol called Supra, Sunitri Protocol for Autism, for the Ayurvedic management of autism spectrum disorders. Apart from clinical practice, he delivers lectures, trains young Vaidyas, writes articles and columns, gives radio talks, etc. So we look forward to your presentation, Dr. Prasad M. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you, ma'am, for uh, the introduction. <clears throat> I hope I am audible. Yeah, you are. You are audible. Yes, thank you. So, I'm going to give you a very short lecture or presentation on the person-centric approach of Ayurveda, a glimpse of Charaka Samkita. First of all, let me offer my salutations to the memory of uh, my Guruji, Vaidya Bhushanam K. Raghavan Thirmulipada, who initiated me to the wonderful world of Ayurveda. Yeah, this is my opening statement. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is my opening statement that Ayurvedic system of treatment. I deliberately use it like that because Ayurveda is not about treatment alone. It has many other aspects related to the uh, human life and nature. But limiting myself to this particular area, Ayurvedic system of treatment is basically post-centered or pro-host and it is highly personalized in its operations. The main term of reference as far as the treatment in Ayurveda is concerned is Purusha. Purusha means the person, the patient, someone who is suffering with an illness. And to say something about Charaka Samhita, everybody may be knowing it, is one of the major textbooks of textbooks of Ayurveda, which is quite famous for the immensity and depth of the subjects <coughs> which are discussed in it. 
which dates back to approximately maybe between the fifth and the third century BCE, which is authored by Sage Agnivesha, but interestingly, non after the Sage Charaga, who improved the work with the rigorous editing. And every aspect of human life in its totality is covered in this very interesting textbook with special reference to healthcare and medical practice. Now, Ayurveda has got two halves in its description. One is Swastavrutta and the other half is Aduravrutta. Swastavrutta is the regimen for the healthy, whereas Aduravrutta is the regimen for the sick person. And in both these halves, alike, the same way, focus is on the person. And I should say, the prime consideration is the individual. I will try to uh, clarify this point. But of course, it, it may not be possible to put forth all the relevance for points from the Charaga Samkhita, which is quite a hefty text. But some of the representative portions are arranged in my presentation. And in this presentation, I have not given any priorities for any particular area or uh, no chronology is maintained when it is compared with the textbook file. <laughs> yeah, we were listening to the Prakriti from Dr. Bhavana ji earlier. The very idea of Prakriti or the natural state, these are the meanings. Prakriti means the natural state or the material cause or the constitution. These are the different context or uh, uh, shades of meaning with which the word Prakriti is used. And Prakriti is the identity of a person, a type of unique fingerprint, which is based on the three doshas, Vada, Pitta and Kapha, at the time of her or his conception in the mother's womb. And uh, this Prakriti has got certain ideas or a concepts which are to be communicated properly. <laughs> Though the Prakriti is determined basically by the status of doshas in the female and male halves, its establishment is influenced by many other factors. It is true that the predominance of dosha is going to be the, the most important criteria which is deciding the prakriti. But the establishment of prakriti of an individual has got many other influences in it, like the age of conception, then the time on, or the season of conception, the health of the female and male partners, then the lifestyle, including the food and other related factors like uh, mental stress or uh, the uh, amount of physical exertion, the sleep pattern, many other things of the female partner. And this Prakriti, of a person is permanent. You can't change it later with some sort of a lifestyle modification or something like that. Once it is established, it is permanent. And this Prakriti influences the physical and mental characteristics of the person. I think even I can say not influences, but it determines the physical and mental characteristics of the person and uh, it can be decisive in the overall health status as well as the morbidity status of the 
individual and this can be the prakriti can be used as a tool to understand or predict the type of diseases that can happen to an individual again regarding that particular possibilities of diseases apart from that once a disease is manifested prakriti can be predictive as far as the course of the disease is concerned and also it helps the vaidya to look for the best treatment options in a given situation again there are some other interesting uh, aspects about prakriti it can be a perfect tool to suggest a healthy lifestyle to an individual and it can be a guideline even for the best career option apart from the domain of medicine and uh, health even the prakriti can be a guideline for the best career option that a person can opt for so there are many things related to prakriti and ayurveda considers prakriti as an important tool to understand a person in his swastha vrutta as well as adura vrutta so that is one unique point where ayurveda shows an inclination towards the individual the person as a whole now importance of upayokta i will come to the details in ayurveda patya ahara or wholesome food is considered as the most important component of maintaining health and also in the treatment of diseases as well patya ahara is very very important even sometimes when you go for an ayurveda treatment with a vaidya i think one of the most important factor that you are getting from the vaidya as an advice will be regarding the proper use of ahara patya ahara and uh, ahara is considered especially by the authors like charaka the source of both health and disease the same thing ahara is the source of both health and disease the way in which ahara is used makes the difference whether you are going to get health or a disease and a great deal of person centric customization can be seen in the use of ahara one can find a list of eight principles made by charaka as the deciding factors of the possible positive and negative outcome of the usage of food and this list is known as ahara vidhi vishesha ayatanas ahara vidhi vishesha ayatanas eight factors like prakriti karana samyoga rashi desha kala upayoga samstha and upayokta the last one given is something which is having the utmost importance upayokta upayokta means the person who consumes the food that makes the major difference or one of the major differences as far as the outcome of the consumption of ahara is concerned so that is a very important consideration in ayurveda again regarding the ahara matra how much food one should consume generally we all live in 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 the times of nutrition the concept of food 
is becoming less and less fashionable and we talk more and more about nutrition. The nutritional value in terms of this much carbohydrate or this much protein, this much fat, minerals, vitamins, micronutrients, etc., etc., they decide whether a stuff can be used or not and if yes, how much. So that is going to be the factor. But uh, coming to the classical Ayurvedic style as, this, as described by Acharya Charaka, we can find a very subjective way or experiential way of determining the matra, ahara matra. And we can find this as when the food, quantity of food is not causing any congested or compressed feeling of the abdomen and chest and there is no aching feeling or the pain over the ribs and when your tummy is not feeling very hefty, sense organs feel light and alert and uh, you feel satiated and quenched and the capacity to engage comfortably after a meal in activities like uh, sitting, standing, lying down or walking or laughing. So no difficulty in engaging any of these activities. Then proper digestion of the ingested food by the time of the next meal and proper nourishment of the body as experienced by the individual in terms of Bala, Varna and Upachaya. So we can find immediate outcomes and long-term benefits in these assessment points. So here also the thrust is given to the experience of the person than the, the caloric values or the contents in terms of the nutritional ingredients. Now, regarding Adura Pariksha, Adura Pariksha, I will come to it. The medical treatment by and large these days are more disease centric and the person or the sufferer has become a redundant factor in the whole business of medical care. Charaga's approach is quite different, which is regarded as the classical Ayurvedic clinical methodology. It is a total mismatch to the present trend. Adura Pariksha, the examination or assessment of the sick person, is the most important part of the business of a Vaidya according to Charaka. And Charaka designates the patient as Karyadesha. Karyadesha means the field or land of all the interventions where everything is happening, the place of happening and the stability or swastya of which is the sole purpose of all operations. So this Adura Pariksha is quite comprehensive and holistic as it is explained by Ajarya Charaka. And it is done for some specific purposes. Before engaging in the act of therapies or treatments, Adura Pariksha is done for number one, to know the Ayus, of the individual, some sort of a measurement of the eyes or the possible longevity of the individual. Then, to know the strength of the patient with the different criteria and also to know the strength of the disease process operating on that particular individual. So, for this Adura Pariksha, Charaga proposes a 10-point assessment format. Number one, Prakriti, 
number two vikruti then three saram samhananam pramanam satmyam sattvam ahara shakti vyayama shakti and vyas i have given the a, a, some uh, basic idea about the the terms used so from prakriti to vyas this 10 point assessment format you can find that the vikruti of course it is a very extensive uh, and elaborate exercise no doubt understanding the nature of the illness but all the remaining nine out of ten they are about the person the nine out of ten is about the person so nine on one side and one on the other side this is how the adura pariksha as per charaka is designed now there is a concept called or a term used by charaga it is need not be a universal concept called uttama bhishak uttama bhishak means bhishak vaidya a physician of the topmost stuff capacity or skill that is uttama bhishak who is an uttama bhishak the intellectual capacity it is a measure of the intellectual capacity. A Vaidya needs to acquire a thorough knowledge of the agents of healing, like the different substances or dravyas which can be used as medicine. And according to Ayurveda, a dravya is understood in terms of its nama, name, rupa, the identifiable appearance, guna, properties, and the karma its effects so from the time immemorial the vaidyas study these things from the very early stages of their uh, learning but at one point charaga ascertains that it is not because of the mere knowledge of these things in terms of nama and rupa that a vaidya is going to be the uttama bhishak but it is based on his intellectual capacity and wisdom to use these medicines in a customized manner in each person, Purusham Purusham Viksha, taking the Desha and Kala into consideration. So, that thrust given on the personalized usage of available materials and uh, substances and other agents of healing is a towering statement made by Ajarya Charaka. Now, coming to the certain specific areas of disease experience, the diseases are divided into Nija, Agandhu and Manasa in Ayurveda. And uh, understanding of mind is very, very important in Ayurveda. It is proposed that the body follows the mind and vice versa, mind follows the body. That is the relation between them. And the treatment of mental diseases involves a big amount of subjectivity. Mind is understood based on three traits in Ayurveda. Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. The traits each trait represents certain characteristics which I have explained in the or mentioned in the slide. Now, coming to the each, each trait in the Sattva, Rajas and Tamas, for practical purposes, for understanding the Sattva, the Manas properly, they, have, they are subtyped. The Sattva is subtyped into Brahma, Arsha, Aindra, Yamya, Varuna, Kaubera, and Gandharva. Rajas, Asura, Rakshasa, Paishaja, Sarpa, Praita, and Shaguna. Tamas as Pashava, Malsya, and Vanaspatya. All these names 
are indicative of specific types of personalities in terms of mental makeup so in the treatment of mental diseases ayurveda resorts to a wide classification of uh, the individual concern and in the treatment of mental diseases as well one can find a wide range of practices and tools which are generally personalized uh, tools so that is also very important now coming to the causation of diseases there is a general consensus that apatya ahara is the most important agent which decides health and disease ayurveda proposes that ahara sambhavam vastu rogascha ahara sambhava so disease and health which we mentioned earlier but this is a highly generalized statement taking the importance and practicality of this statement for granted it may be interesting to listen to a discussion that is happening in charaka samhita in this regard charaka ascertains this point the importance of food but while making that sort of an ascertaining statement his the the student of uh, sage atreya named agnivesha puts up a query this is, looks like a story but the message is very very strong agnivesha puts up a query about the subjective differences that is evident in this regard the the crux of his question was like this those persons who take wholesome food stay healthy good no problem and those who take unwholesome food fall sick but it happens otherwise also that means those who take wholesome food are seen to fall sick and those who take unwholesome food can be seen staying healthy as well so the question is how far is it sensible to generalize the importance of food so now atreya answers this question the answer goes like this see if one follows a healthy food habit she or he will not get sick with those diseases related to it but there are other causes than diet for diseases they are number 1 kala viparyaya kala viparyaya means climate change climate change may not be as conceived today these are times but maybe a localized climate changes second is pratnabaradha pratnabaradha means physical mental and verbal deeds without consideration of health and third improper engagement with the indriyarthas indriyarthas means the objects of sensory experience like sound touch light taste and smell so the kala viparyaya may be widespread but the other two that means pratnavaradha and the indulgence in the indriyarthas are highly individual oriented and interestingly sage atreya highlights some points number 1 that is what is shown in the slide all the apatya or the unwholesome agents need not necessarily be potent enough to influence the doshas of a person this statement proposes that there can be subjective variations as far as the response of a living body to the extrinsic etiological factors is concerned number 2 
all the doshas need not be deranged equally even if the external triggers succeed in influencing the body the doshas need not be deranged equally in response to it and this statement tells us that the internal changes happening in a body in response to a trigger need not be identical and hence cannot be standardized that is also a very important statement and number 3 is about a concept called vyadhi kshamatva chanaka proposes all shariras need not have the capacity of vyadhi kshamatva what is vyadhi kshamatva vyadhi kshamatva is understood in two planes of operation is a principle which is understood in two different planes of operation number 1 is the capacity of a system to prevent the onset it is not inset it is onset of a disease process and number 2 is the capacity of a system to resist the progression of a disease process which is already operational two aspects number 1 is the capacity to prevent the onset of a disease process number 2 is the capacity to resist the progression of a disease process which is already operational and charaga makes an observation that there can be differences in the way in which the vyadhi kshamatva operates in different individuals actually Sir it would so that we can have some discussion yeah yeah i'm concluding this is the last this was the last slide so what i was trying to say is why we are need to be considerate of all these subjective factors in depth while understanding a vyadhi and strategizing strategizing its chikitsa and these concluding statements these three slides can be considered as the cornerstones of the person centric approach that ayurveda is trying to highlight thank you very much thank you so much and i'm sorry for the interruption no problem it is perfect so now the paper both the papers are open for discussion the previous one by dr bhavna prasha and the this one by dr prasad m both are dealing with the person centric approach but from different dimensions and different approaches so you may ask questions or make some comments if there is nobody else i think i am on details so it is for dr bhavna yeah yeah dr bhavna yes. i came at the almost the end part of your lecture and i i heard that you have worked on hy hypoxia in fact i also worked in hypoxia a long time back on mm -hmm. hiv1 alpha expression of hiv1 alpha mm -hmm. and uh, with that you know some questions came to my mind the one thing is that uh, uh, on the basis of hypoxia and the related you know sfps uh, you have identified certain phenotypes like vat kapha and pitta phenotypes yeah. Yeah. my question is that even inside the body different organs show different oxygen levels right yeah and different temperatures also not only oxygen but the different right. temperature like uh, for cancer tissue you know that it's always hypoxic and i i may inform you because i worked on that testicular tissue which is as hypoxic as a mitochondria mm. almost zero oxygen very little oxygen concentration it keeps on bursting with sperms and probably hypoxia is there to control that so the otherwise man may drain out in the production of sperms only so uh, 
would you classify different organs according to their vata, kapha, and pitta, pitta type? Absolutely. Right. So, excellent question, uh, uh, sir. Uh, so, uh, just as we say, and individuals are uh, of vat, pit, or kaf prakriti. Uh, as I earlier mentioned, vat, pit, kaf are physiological entities, and they are present in every system, and they run across all tissues. But every tissue has a different proportion of vat, pit, and kaf expressed in relation to their physiological demands or uh, the nature uh, basic nature of the tissue is of a certain kind so their vatpit cuff prakriti of every tissue is also different and that is described in ayurveda to you will be surprised to know that even tissues and, uh, and organ systems have uh, have been told to be of vat dominant pit dominant and one of the slides i showed a uh, vatpit cuff and then i wrote tissues and then i wrote phenotypes so it, that means that those tissues were naturally dominant of vata uh, like bone tissue or like nervous tissue uh, similarly pitta is dominated in uh, lung uh, liver spleen and all the all the you know enzymatic and digestive activities wherever they are to be taken uh, highly present pitta is more dominant over there Similarly, kapha resident tissues are like uh, adipose tissue or a muscle tissue or even all the synovial fluid and all the membranes which have coatings and lubricating activity. So they are all cuff dominant organ systems. So likewise, every cell type and tissue type, depending on uh, their nature and function, they, they have been classified to be the resident or a highly resident of that dosha. So it's certainly every tissue and this one has a prakriti. Now coming back to your question of different oxygen levels are there even in different tissues. So this was coming from Ayurveda uh, and we also know that even kidney is a highly hypoxic uh, tissue. So likewise there are different uh, uh, oxygen levels in the tissue. So whether those individuals who are whose no normal metabolic or a molecular phenotype is like that of a hypoxic phenotype whether their respective tissues will all the more be uh, more uh, of affected by those doshas so that is why we are, we are also studying different uh, we are we are also trying to study the cellular effects of uh, vat pit and cuff uh, so cellular model of uh, prakriti is also something we are building and we have built uh, lymphoblastoid cell lines out of this uh, peripheral blood of the uh, different prakriti individuals to understand that even if it is the same cell type whether uh, different prakriti uh, cell types uh, cells will respond differently to environmental uh, hypoxia so that is one work they are doing but uh, to access different tissues uh, of different prakriti individuals it is different but as difficult but as far as theoretically understanding it is concerned yes ayurveda describes prakriti even to different tissues and organ systems thank you thank you, thank you, thank you so much yes yes incidentally professor anand kumar also is a medical doctor he has retired from aims yes so the discussion between two scientists and doctors now there is a pen raised by dr arvind gupta please Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, it was uh, for the first time I heard uh, that uh, there is a lot of research being done to understand the uh, basis of uh, Ayurveda. And uh, this is uh, very encouraging. Uh, of course, I didn't understand all of what you said because I'm not uh, from that discipline. But still, in a, as a uh, layperson, uh what would you say is uh, firstly whether this vat cuff and pit can be actually measured and what is it that you are measuring when you say something is vat something is pit and something is cuff and uh, whether there is uh, an uh, uh, agreement among scientists that uh, vat cuff and pit uh, uh, this uh, 
uh, you know the combinations etc this can be classified and uh, then can be applied to various uh, uh, situations you try to just explain about the tissues and so on and their nature so mm -hmm. whether all the tissues can be explained in terms of uh, these uh, three vat cuff and pitan waves yes. and then to a lay person if you have to explain what is what, what is cuff and what is pit, just to, in a lay language, what would you yes. say? Yes. So, uh, for a lay person, if I have, uh, I'll ask, answer your first, last question first. Uh, uh, it's like uh, what, pit and cuff is like something, something which is related to movement, activity, taking in, taking out, anything. So, that activity signaling movement is all about what. When you take something, you have to assimilate it in your body and make it your own. So conversion. So conversion is a component which is done by Pitta. All enzymatic activity, digestion, metabolism, mm -hmm. even conversion of ideas, thoughts, your intelligence, whether what you heard and what I understood, and that that is also dependent on a kind of Pitta called Sadhak Pitta. Then once you have taken something in, then you have digested it or assimilated it. Now you also need to store it so that you can build your own structures and grow uh, the body and maintain the body or make up for the wear and tear. So that, so that growth, stability, structure, providing lubrication, providing all kinds of barriers, this is all cuff. So it's actually taking in, assimilating and storing. And then again, for excretion of the wastes, again, vat comes into picture. So it is like functions are divided. And now you can imagine different why different tissues will have different kinds of proportions of vat, pit, and cuff, depending on their natural functions. Now, coming back to how do you measure it? So when it comes to measurement, like Ayurveda talks about hetu and lakshan. So if vat, pit, cuff are hetu or the causes, then they will manifest or they will express themselves uh, through something, right? So that expression in uh, Ayurveda is all described as features or lakshana. Say, for example, if vat has expressed high, it will show up as maybe uh, too, too much dryness or too much, too much leanness or too much activity, too, too fast thoughts like that. That happens in vat prakriti also. Likewise, if it is pitta which is expressing very highly, you might have lots of metabolic activities. So a lot of perspiration, a lot of thirst, a lot of hunger, maybe anger, all that thing. Yeah. If there is cuff getting highly expressed, then you have more tendency for all that physiological functions, they get manifested in the form of clinically visible features, which is excess storage, maybe weight gain, maybe stability, not taking too much part in physical activity like that. So everything manifests itself as a clinical presentation. But now it, when it comes to laboratory, uh, laboratory medicine or, in, or investigative medicine, we need to have some tissue in hand, which is like a peripheral blood. And if those things uh, are to be measured, we can measure through some, uh, you know, metabolite like lipids or hemoglobin, or all those things which we measure in the clinical diagnosis, we can measure that. We can measure DNA level differences. We can measure RNA level differences, metabolite differences. So using the blood, we can measure all those differences. Now coming to the consensus, since we are the uh, first pioneer group of uh, individuals who have started this thing, that is why we are doing one after the other multiple studies at multiple levels so that we can reach to a consensus. And this is being validated uh, across different studies also, uh, whether whenever we are saying VAT or whenever we are saying PIT, we are seeing this kind of uh, genes to be upregulated or these kind of uh, processes to be different. Every time when we are seeing this, that is why I showed that triangle that even at a, a genetic level, even at the uh, level of my uh, differential susceptibility and, and by doing different levels of analysis we are coming to the same kinds of processes and that uh, holds a lot of importance in science to have validation across different the egln1 gene that we identified to be responsible for high altitude adaptation using our method you'll be surprised to know the same genetic variation 
to be linked to high altitude adaptation and hypoxia responsiveness many world population studies have also shown although they did not go by prakriti method they had done by conventional methods but the genetic variation being linked to high altitude adaptation is coming uh, repeatedly so that tells about some kind of a um, uh, validate validation of this approach so this multiple such works will actually uh, be required and a more uh, uh, robust uh, uh, kind of uh, observations will emerge from those work. but so far while we are looking at different levels like cellular level molecular level physiological level every level we are checking to be able to come with to that consensus and we have been able to reach to some consensus to a great extent uh, in with respect to hypoxia hemostasis immune response metabolism to be getting associated at molecular level with vat pitt and cuff thank so, you uh, I, i really appreciate the uh, <laughs> fantastic questions and that gave me an opportunity to clarify certain more things thank you very much thanks a lot Keep it up, whatever good work you are doing, please. Dr. Pras, any questions to Dr. Prasad? I just wanted to uh, tell that the what Dr. Prasad mentioned, and uh, so this was absolutely in sync. Actually, I enjoyed because was uh, all that basic theoretical aspect that was to be talked about with more details. He actually did it very elaborately, and it is the same thing that we are kind of trying to look through in the in the lens of uh, in uh, modern scientific parameters and this. He presented it on the basis of Charaka Sangita, the textual aspect of it. You presented the experimental aspect of it, isn't yeah. it? and in a nutshell i presented in the beginning the charak part but this was good that he kind of took time to elaborately uh, speak about that that's uh, something i just wanted to thank him for thank you so much both the speakers for this session which came for which was person centric approach of ayurveda so we'll break for 5 minutes and then we will we'll start our next session integration of lifestyle and diet in ayurveda which has been hinted in brief by dr prasad but now we shall listen to two um, elaborate presentations on the same lifestyle and diet at 3 5 i think it's already 3 4 so we can start right away there's hardly any time to break so now i call upon dr narayan nandi Dr. Narayan Nambi is presently the principal and chief physician of Ashtangam Ayurveda Chikitsalaya and Vidya Peetham Ayurveda Medical College and Hospital, Kottanad, Palakkad, Kerala. He is also honorary director of academic and clinical services of SNA Aushadha Aushadha Shala, founded by Ashtavaidyam, Sri Sur. I cut moose in 1920 in Kerala. He received BA MS degree from Mysore University, MD Ayurveda Vachaspati degree from Rajiv Gandhi University of Health Sciences, Bengaluru, Karnataka. He has been contributing in the field of Ayurveda education, research, pharmaceutics, and healthcare policy matters. in india and abroad since last 20 years his publications include both popular series as well as scientific articles research papers in index journals and contributed chapters in books and he has edited a book published by springer he is popular in international teaching schools as faculty member of ayurveda He is also, yeah. also actively involved in Ayurveda. Thank you, Dr. Prasad and uh, Dr. To European thank you, Dr. Bhavna Prasher and Dr. Prasad for your experience. So I call upon Dr. Narayan Nambi for his paper 
titled Diet and Lifestyle in Ayurveda. Uh, good afternoon to all. Am I audible and clear the slide? Am I? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon all. Uh, the title given to me is about the integration of diet and lifestyle. And I'm I'm fortunate that already uh, Rajiv Ji as well as Rama Jaisundar Madam has already put some platform. And also the just previous speaker of M. Prasad too had some basic platform so that I could start with. Uh, there is a common proverb in Ayurveda, which uh, I could say that Pathya Sadigadas Tasya Kim Aushadhan Shevane Pathya Sadigadas Tasya Kim Aushadhan Shevane Which means that when diet is wrong, medicine is of no use. And when diet is correct, and medicine of no work. But that, that is a sentence in uh, 200 BC. But now the sentence is like this. That people are fed by the food industry, which pays no attention to the health at all and are treated by health industry, which pay no attention to food. So we are in the two sides, like a fork and a, <laughs> fork and a knife. So one side we could see what you take, another side you cut. So we have a surgical school and we have food industry. So I'll just go to some of the quickly to give a glimpse of how Ayurveda, how Ayurveda looked into it. Of course, we all know very well that uh, food is divine for us. Uh, because in Indian culture, we say uh, food is called Annapurneshuri. Uh, so, food is divine, and Ayurveda also says that Aushadevyo Annam. So, body is derived out of derived out of food. So, generally, when we have the word food, we think uh, it's uh, something a collection of uh, materials which may be helpful for nurturing our body tissues that give enough energy for the body, give strength or happiness into it. But more than that, it has many things else to do. For Ayurveda is concerned, food is something much more than what it nourishes uh, the body. The Sula path goes to the body, Sukshma path goes to the manas, and it may be Sukshma, Sukshma path may go to different part of things. It may also may be a, a, a journey towards the moksha because of that. And when we look into that uh, con content of the food, generally we think that it is something related with a composition, <coughs> having some set of material, and how does it reflect the body and how does it reflect the soul? Unfortunately, as rightly mentioned by many of my previous speakers, I want to say that in the reductionistic life in our, in the current last few centuries, we worked a lot in the farms to fork. You understand what I mean? The food industry, we spend a lot of money to get the best out of it. We spend a lot of money to find right proportion of food. We spend a lot of money uh, to prepare in a good packages, preservatives, there are so many things. But are we really working on from the fork to soul? How we should start? Okay, we have a food. Is there are something what traditional knowledge system can want to say? Definitely, that is the point. Of course, we all know that uh, uh, the world has a different food cultures. It can extend it from a large varieties of food, from a simple South Indian banana leaf food to the most complex food from different countries. And meanwhile, there is also an eating order in Ayurveda too. So that like start from sweet, then go like that. There are very interesting things. And moreover, traditionally, we have different vessels for cooking, what type of uh, vessels we should use in different food different food has been told to use a different type of uh, vessels to be cooked and fundamentally what what has been lost is we have been taught how to prepare food we have been taught so many things but we are poorly invested we are not invested or detailed or we are poorly focused on how to eat what to eat why to eat how much we should to eat these are really, really missed. So from Ayurvedic point of view, these points are very, very important since food is made up of Panja Mahabhuta and it not only maintains just the physical structure as right mentioned by our previous, it extended to the sense organs, manas, and fundamentally it is also from Trigunath Miga, that means Sattva is a sum of compositions also there, 
That is why in Bhagavad Gita and all, there are very specific says, <laughs> also, yadayasam, yadayam, yadayasam, like they say very specifically the time spent food and all. Again, Rasaguna Vijay Vipaka is a fundamental essentiality Ayurveda looks from any food and it is also responsible for health as well as ill health. So in, in totality, if we catch the whole Ahara concept of food into Ayurveda, it comes in just one slide like this because the food is being categorized as rightly Rama, Ramaji mentioned about the different type of guna. And these 20 gunas which reflect to the dosha, then it reflect to vidya, vipaka, so on, and which somehow, somehow contributed into the living system, whether it may be healthy or ill healthy. And if that is the case, if that is the case, what would be the basic things to remember? As I mentioned before, we have we also have to invest certain amount of time to understand this, some of the basic things, that is from port to soul. So this beautifully explained by Charaka, as our, my previous speaker has mentioned. So just sit on, jumping on to this point will be very interesting. You know, the sofhav of the food, whether the guru or leku, what a quality of food, what we have, based on the culture we have, based on different situations we have, these are very important. And not only that, it's just limited about the quality, it also related to the hygienic qualities or it may be nutritional qualities, even for the organoleptic uh, qualities also should be considered in that place. And of course, some yoga, the mixing of multiple things. This is also very beautifully, you know, whenever you travel different countries, you can see food has been prepared very differently. But what would be the method of mixing is a very, very interesting thing. What should be mixed, what should not be mixed, in which climate it can be suitable. This is very interesting information which Ayurveda can be utilized for the future. Another thing is the samskara. There are various modifications of food has been nowadays. This area is over mostly either by putting something into the freezer at the low temperature or added with some preservatives or by different materials we do samskara. But Ayurveda explains a very method, specific method of making different samskara because samskara is gunandara adhan vichre which makes some guna enhancement depends upon what we need. It's not simply you throw the sausage then it things, or you simply uh, keep the expectations of its color, flavor, or nutrient as it is. Besides that, it gives some modifications of the guna depending upon the place where we are. So, just like a jackfruit can be made samskara because there are only few seasons we get jackfruit. So, we can make different samskara, pluck it and fry it, and it can be a jackfruit edible. Very importantly, another thing is the matra. This is a very, very big challenge. Matra, the quantity of the food, how much we should eat. Nowadays, this point has become a big discussion in different countries too. So I'll give you some examples. Very often, people would say that in Ayurveda, okay, there are half of the stomach is eaten by food, then one third, another one fourth is by water, and then one fourth is kept like this. And people will sometimes say, okay, it's, uh, it's a very Indian way of doing these type of things. No, there is also Western idea. Uh, there are also in Western countries, there is a habit of hands. This is a habit of explaining hands. You know, if you're taking butter, if you're taking cheese, this is the proportion. If, there is a, if you're using the beach, of course, it's uh, largely in the winter countries, winter areas like Russia, other countries, the meat may be proportion more. And the quantity of ice cream, quantity of pasta. So it's not only India has uh, Ahara, Kalpana, Vichesa, many countries too. But what is interesting for us is that most of this tradition has been lost. And definitely Ayurveda like knowledge system has a great potential through which we can revive their local and local food traditions. 
I want to highlight that point that we have to revive local health traditions, local food traditions very much because that is how through which we can enhance immunity. Just like previous speaker was telling before the uh, Rajiv also was telling, eating Ayurveda, even Ramana was highlighting that point. Disease cure is something different. If we want to really enter into the public health, if we want to really enter into the public health all over the world, Ayurveda is a beautiful medical system. It's not the only framework of a set of medicinal plants or set of materials we use as a healing. There are extensions to the Ahara, Ajara, Bihara, Bitara, all the dimensions of it. And unfortunately, most of the countries, especially the European countries, they have lost many of their tradition, maybe due to different wars or maybe other reasons. And they were really looking about the information, time testing information from traditional countries like <laughs> India, Japan. There are many Asian countries where they have a strong tradition of uh, strong tradition of different type of diet. Again, so nowadays people start about the mindfulness, you know, mindful eating and other things. But what is important is also that the desha you know, from the place where the food is originated, where it has been cultivated, what is the consumer habitat versus the origin of food. This is very, very important thing. You know, if we have certain food is being grown in a particular climatological situation, travel to another country, there are possibilities that it can, may not be so suitable. So we have to check into that also. And also, <coughs> the desha, the place of origin of the food versus the consumption of habits, Besides this, there are many materials like uh, things come from other country and looking about Agni, we have to decide this. For this, we have some basic templates. That's the beauty of Ayurveda. Ayurveda fundamentally gives multiple templates on which we can try to understand food in a different way. One good template is identifying the seasons. You know, we all have uh, six Rudus mentioned in Ayurveda. Uh, so, Vasanta, Grishma, Varsha, Sharat, Khemanda, Shishira, the six Rudu. And each Rudu, Ayurveda was very beautifully described. What happened to the dosha? What happened to the sun? What happened to the moon? What happened to the water? What happened to the earth? What happened to the creatures? And how we have to create an adaptation uh, in different situations. This could be the beautiful thing, can be taken as a basic template for the travel medicine too. You know, nowadays, uh, there's an important medicine is emerging called travel medicine. You know, people are frequently traveling, either maybe for the purpose of tourism or maybe businesses. So they shift from one climate to another climate, one temperature to another temperature. Many times they may have some challenges in adaptation. So what would be the medicine there? Normally people will say there's a travel medicine. But if you are staying for a certain period of time, you need a technique, you need some advisors, you need some guidance to which we adopt the existing situation. I used to <coughs> explain to my patients or my friends from the Europe that, okay, as soon as you travel from one place to another place, you have to look at the dosha status there and try to understand which dosha is dominant. Then try to take the food off, opposite of that dosha. Like that, there are, Ayurveda could be very, very useful even in this different season. So, from where we have the data, nothing but we have beautiful descriptions of each Ritu. Ayurveda classical text to describe what are the diets should be followed, what are the diets should not be taken. That so we have a set of do's do and don'ts of this. I don't want to elaborate this time because it's a shortage of time. I don't want to elaborate this point here, but I just want to uh, elaborate few things that people also believe that. Taking fruits, okay, good fruits is okay, fine. Taking protein is, is fine. But from Ayurvedic point of view, it's not important what you eat. Of course, it's important what you eat, but it is much more important what you digest. This aspect is very, very crucial for Ayurveda. It's not that when we have the idealistic diet, having a good amount of good amount of protein, carbohydrates, the trace elements, starch, minerals, metals. It's not enough for a person to have a healthy. 
there are with things like good appetite agni is very important there are many other things comes in the scene then upayoga vyavastha the food etiquette it probably india has a wide variety of food etiquette because we may have in south india we have a banana leaf just like the shape of the tongue and we have large number of food items and there are even in many part of the world many part of india itself we have different type of eating and serving style is very important uh, for example in india we have a particular uh, you know food etiquette but whereas in russia or whereas in japan we have different type of etiquette so etiquette keeps our manners very calm cool and you know tanme manasi that is you know having a proper manners in that will be uh, and at last the ubhyogta ubhyog, the end user how he enjoy there is a statement as a wise indian man said why should i use the fork when i have five fingers so the ubhyogta vyavastha how we utilize the thing with five fingers so become very very important in uh, in, uh, in explanation why this is true so what i want to highlight at the point is that even from the classical textbook it is able to explain most of the things what we really missing nowadays just just to get the content together is not enough so if i put the whole idea into 10 points these are the 10 points i would like to highlight which is the 10 points the 10 points are very well known to all of you one is priya and apriya that means you like it or not like it sensual pleasure and another common word we use is called satmya or satmya then virutha and avirutha then patya and apatya which is favorable or unfavorable or hita and ahita so starting from the tongue to the ultimate whether it is good for your totality that which addresses all the issues of uh, all the understanding of the ayurveda so it has multiple types many times could may be very priya but not necessary should be very satmya could may be very priya not necessary should be avirutha so like that but nowadays people whenever the people speaks about food they speak about fitness health uh, bmi but that's not the case ayurveda extends the food into larger dimensions as nicely previously mentioned by dr prasad about the happiness sleep after having food we should get a proper sleep also satmya satyam nowadays gut microbiome is a good uh, discussion area you know large number of people are discussing gut microbiome presence of uh, gut microbes this has been told much earlier in charaka samhita itself roge sarve bi mandagno sudra mudra alicha so mandagni different challenges with that is the major things so uh, thing. and importantly the patya patya very common word is in use by ayurveda which is pathe hidam so are you following in the right direction or are you following the wrong direction towards your life for enjoying your full expansion of your uh, health and large number of people also we be under big confusion for good confusion what i should take am i am i right to take these am i for am i expected to follow these definitely here ayurveda has a great role to play can you please uh, audience can you please mute or mic please mute your mic please Okay, so patya patya, and uh, because it's also becoming really apathya sometimes when we are speaking. <laughs> uh, another important thing which internationally has to be discussed. This is one of the greatest contribution I should say from Ayurveda, identifying virutha and avirutha. Nowadays, with the in the industrial development in the food industry. <laughs> there are different type of combination has been experienced experimented and it is our duty to identify the incompatibility of the food. that 
that is called virutha because many times virutha food can produce large problems it may be a short period to larger period ayurveda beautifully describes nearly 18 types of virutha based on place time agni quantity uh, many many things i don't want to put it all the things here but these are very crucial you know i i, I always uh, believe that okay we have a, a, we have a, a product with in our hand so if we have a, a explanation that this comes from this country this is containing this ingredient probably in the future we may have a picture of ayurveda or a qr code there so we scan this is very good for vata pitta reducing kapha this is very good for increasing kapha that will be wonderful to do and there are many type of virutha has been explained in the ayurvedic book <coughs> you may be knowing some examples are given in the fish and the milk but virutha is not simply adding some uh, taking the food and then after time it produces some problem it also ad- uh, addresses large number of things so from the food perspective the biggest difference i would like to put it in a, in a gist that the conventional nutrition and ayurveda ahara kalpana both are having a group huge difference why do we eat from the conventional nutrition perspective okay it is a habit based on the social eating physical appearance emotions have the lot of role to play but so far i am is concerned taking the prana <laughs> that uh, prana are taking prana inside uh, um, prana inside very uh, very, very important aham vaishwanaro bhuktva praninam deham ashraya so i am there in my body as a prana so that idea is very very important and secondly that's point actually rightly linked to the uh, idea what uh, ramaj sundar has mentioned from physical to emotional to intellectual level different prana different levels of uh, the sheet and second focus so, second the conventional nutrition always try to focus on the calorie and count them how much calorie we eat etc but for ayurveda uh, how individual process first what we eat we think about the guna we think about the vidya vipaka becomes the important role to play and more importantly instead of the classical typical categorization like carbohydrates minerals metals proteins fruits we have a idea of balancing the six phases and the the real sentence of ayurveda is that you are what you digest not what you eat so what we digest become very very important so we have to think what we eat why to eat and when to eat is also become a very very important something actually this is a great role in the future ayurveda in the part of the t20 or g20 part definitely ayurveda can be uh, taken as uh, uh, besides the medicine we can be life coach you know we can teach the people how to structure their diet which can be act as pro medicine which can act as like a medicine so that you you get minimum difference so there are there are possibility that ayurveda can take role of this area where diet as as a medicine in when different situations come so that is the first that is why we have shanti mantra you know sahana bhavadu savano gunaktu so that is why we have a shanti mantra shortly i want to put another few more points before i conclude because in the lifestyle it is a complex area where ayurveda also have some points to say so ayurveda says that the totality of a person totality is a person is called sadvrutta uh, that means a person has to, if they want to have a lifestyle corrections or lifestyle changes they have to follow multiple things from inside you control your urges from inside control your emotions and then have a lifestyle in a personal level then you have a lifestyle based on the climate then you have a lifestyle based on the environment when like that it starts from inside that is why the first shloka of ayurvedic textbook called ragadi roga and sadhana shakta so the raga the continuous desire of something is the important thing and in that sadhurtam 
I will not describe Dinacharya, Rupacharya, which we all know very well. There are even the Manasika Bhavas. This is this is become very, very important. Nowadays, many, many people facing these and many, many people are really looking about Ayush systems because Ayush system gives a lot of hope for our existence because of its very proactive nature and existence with the greater values in our life. Akrotham, Thaidyam, Loba, Shoga, Bhaya, Krotha, Mana, Vega, Vidhare. So when people work in, under different stress, excessive overtime, over and work, poor marital relationships and all, they're really looking for some alternative medical system, not simply to have some pill for their ill, rather they need some help. It may be yoga, it may be Ayurveda, they are really looking for a possibility of alternative systems. And in that play, really Ayurveda can take a major role, not only as a medical system. I still want to highlight that disease care is something become a small minority in future. Rather, life, life care, health care, enjoying the quality of life, ex, ex, enjoying the fullest lifespan at its best possible way would be the future. And definitely, there are enough studies shows that, like uh, different studies I mentioned in the slides about the depressions, anxieties, anger, hostilities, and all, alarmingly, alarmingly increasing in different countries. And they are really looking for some alternatives, and not as medicine, just only not only as a drug, rather a medical system that can really guide the people in such a way that that have a better life so that they will have a, a peace of mind in their life. Uh, so Ayurveda extend from personal care to the personal centric care to the environmental care, environmental care to the social care and social care to the world care. So Ayurveda at last says Atmavat Sadadam Pashir so you look at the old creatures, Atmos Sadadam Pashir. So you look at the old creatures together so that Ayurveda can take into totality. So a small part, small small part is called Bhaga. You know, a unit of the a unit of is called Bhaga. So Ayurveda can complete the circle. So Ayurveda, that is why the authors of Ayurvedic books are called Bhagavan, you know. Bhagavan Akshraya, Bhagavan Agnivesha and all Bhagavan. So that means they complete the whole Sabhrita, all the circle of it. They have a totality. By these words, I am thankful for all of you and giving me an opportunity to speak. And I'm happy to hear some of the questions and try to answer it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Namaste. Like, one should not eat curd in the night. But such types of statements which are available in Ayurveda, nobody knows and nobody follows these days. But they are very, very valuable according to our climate, according to our Desha Kala, as you said, and climate change. You also mentioned about Sadhvritta and Swastha Vritta. There is a correlation between the mental makeup and the health of body because mind and body are interrelated. Then you also suggested about Bhagavad Gita when it talks of three types of food, Sattvika, Rajasa and Tamasa. So these principles of Ayurveda, Dosha, Tridosha, Vata, Pitta and Kapha. Three Guna, Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. Three Sutra, then this Hetu, Linga and Aushvata. These are formula for Ayurveda. And you also mentioned 10 points, Priya and Apriya, Satmya, Asatmya, Viruddha, Aviruddha and most importantly, Pathya and Apathya. Food that is good for our health and that which is not good for us. But these days nobody bothers about these ideas. 
especially children, they don't even know about this because in our times, these were the things that elder generation always used to quote. So um, I think this is a very practical aspect of Ayurveda, which needs to be projected and applied this Ahara Kalpana. Now this paper is open for discussion. Yeah, please. Please identify yourself. Yeah, myself, uh, Dr. Madhumita And uh, so I have been, I came to this conference because I have a tremendous interest in the in the mind. Okay. So I have a question for uh, Maya. So nowadays, the concept of um, natural vegan diet is coming up in the whole world. So people are, and even naturopathy is also prescribing to go for a vegan and natural diet since that is raw diet. So, and they are uh, differentiating food according to the alkalinity. So two types of diets basically they are saying, um, those are alkaline and those are acidic. And alkaline is good for health and acidic is not good. So what is uh, Ayurvedic perspective of uh, this alkaline and acidic diet. So what does it say? And what we should follow? Actually, in this modern timing, we are confused. We should follow a raw diet, we should follow naturopathy, or we should follow the Ayurvedic perspective that is uh, partly cooked and partly raw. So what is the Ayurvedic perspective of? Ayurvedic concept of diet uh, is very, very simple. It's not it's not vegetarianism, it's not vegetarianism, Ayurveda. Uh, Ayurveda never says directly anywhere that we should follow vegetarianism. Neither the other way too. Uh, the idea of Ayurveda is to think that depending upon the Agni, Desha, Kala, there are some determinants of uh, choosing the food. This is very vital. So they have made a set of determinants to selection of the food, another set of determinants to complete the digestion of the totality. So as you are seeing in my slide, I put the second part. That means uh, I mentioned about the Samyoga, Sabha, Samskara, Desha, Kala. These are the other constituents which help the uh, food to get digested, uh, have a proper agni. The other side is that how to select it. This is based on very based on different situations. For the roti is different, for vaya is different, for the age is different, there are other different concepts. Another thing I want to highlight is that uh, the, uh, the vegetarianism uh, is, uh, can be explained in a different way. I was addressing a vegetarian conference uh, because since I am a vegetarian from my birth, so they invited me for an international conference to vegan. So there is a discussion happening, do Ayurveda recommends directly vegetarianism? I told both the ways, because there are in the classical textbook, they explain meat. It doesn't mean that it should be eaten. Maybe in the purpose of a medical purpose, they might have told. Even they have described the uh, meat of uh, lion, elephant too. That means they are not really for eating. So maybe there are situations can situation comes where we there is shortage of something. So you find some set of gunas in that meat which can be utilized as well. That's a different question. So for the food is concerned, Ayurveda directly never mentions that we should follow things. But the idea is that when you want to have a spiritual progression, you know, the basic idea of uh, our India is that we should have a spiritual progression. So we have to have more and more sattvic food and we should have a less and less uh, tamasic and rajasic food. That is the idea. So if you want to get more and more sattvic food, so we should have lesser the transmission of the energy through different creatures. So solar energy <coughs> is the primordial uh, source of energy which we could take, which is where uh, human being is not possible to us. Maybe some creatures in the Himalayas may be able to do, uh, but we cannot. So our first source is plants. So from the plants to the photosynthesis and the other things uh, around uh, 35 to 45 percentage of the energy is entrapped in the leaves. 
can be taken and the food as a food. So plant is the first source. So and it's only one body is transformed. But if it is from the plant to other creature, to the worm or the chicken or the beef, eating that food undergoes multiple food bodies. So the prana will change, the karma will change. So two things will change. One is the prana in that food will change because it undergoes multiple sharira. Second thing, the prana, uh, the, the karma of that creature also changes. So because of these reasons, those who are really looking for spiritual progression, <coughs> they have a tendency to minimize the multiple sources, our prior secondary, tertiary, or fourth uh, category of food items, then they will choose the primary source. Again, in the plant, the underground stem modifications are considered as tamasic. The middle part of the things are called uh, jadasic, and the upper part, the flowers, fruits, are more considered as sattvic. That is why the reason in India, most of the spiritual people, they try to choose uh, fruits or the seeds. Uh, these things are being taken more. So that is the basic idea. Thank Sorry you. for the long answer. Thank you so much. I think Dr. Gupta has raised his hand. Dr. Gupta, you have a question, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting uh, uh, concepts. I have a very simple question. During the COVID, uh, there was a lot of talk about uh, enhancing the immunity. And a lot of products also came out in the market. What do you think of uh, uh, those products and also what are the simple things that one should do to enhance one's uh, immunity and what does ayurveda say about it okay the first part is that do, during the covid time the, fundamentally the issue happened you know the cause has a problem uh, the idea of ayurveda is that it is very difficult to uh, identify the fight uh, the agent outside so try to improve the host immunity. So to improve the host specific immunity, there are different methods. One thing, keeping the Agni the best. That's the first thing Ayurveda always say, try to keep your Agni best. Second thing, keep your channels. It's called Shrotas, as rightly mentioned by before also by Rama, Madam. We have different Shrotas called channels. Keep the channels as clean as best. <coughs> as clean as possible. Not always possible, but as clean as Third thing, proper, proper identify the right food in the right time. These are the things that have been given. And during the COVID period, for example, Ayurveda has done enormous effect. For example, in Kerala, around 20 lakh people, by government of Kerala, 20 lakh people have been given Ayurvedic products during the COVID period under the public health department. And they were very, very successful in bringing the minimizing the symptoms also repeated arrival of the symptoms. I can definitely, I can share you those uh, articles, sir. It is a very interesting article uh, published by uh, one of the peer reviewed journal funded by government of Kerala uh, regarding the COVID. And there is also the last part of the question is, what would be the <coughs> things, basically thing, what we could do? Uh, that is thing, uh, what I, I always try to say to the people that, uh, Eat the food, half, half of the food every day. I mean, if you are eating, if you are able to eat, for example, if you are able to eat what, what is full, you take half of the food, that is fine. That could be the good habit. Second thing, having a good exercise, at least some 30 minutes of some rigorous exercise or some yoga pranayama and keep your mind very very stress, less stressful period. This is more than enough. And Ayurveda always tried to say, to take some herbs if there is needed, like Amalaki, Tripala, like that. Thank you. Professor Rama Jay Sundar, you raise your hand. Do you have a question? This will be the last question. Yeah, no, no, I just wanted to make a very quick comment on that question on, uh, you know, naturopathy. So uh, Ayurveda is a treasure of information on diet and nutrition. And it uh, categorically says that uncooked food should not be eaten. 
So if I were you, I would follow the information given in Ayurveda on diet and nutrition because, you know, it has uh, uh, thousands of years of expertise and knowledge which is documented. So that's all I just wanted to say. Thank you so much, Dr. Narayanan Nambi. I thank those who intervened and raised some questions and this useful discussion could take place. Now we move on to the next and last for today speaker, Dr. Manjunath Nandi, Krishna Murthy. Last but one, because we have one more session and one more speaker after the tea break. Dr. Manjunath Nandi Krishnamurti, he will speak on healthy aging through yoga and Ayurveda based lifestyle. He is the pro vice chancellor and the director of research at S. Vyasa University, Bengaluru. He has completed bachelor's degree in naturopathy and yogic sciences from Mangalore University and a PhD in yoga and geriatric medicine from S. Vyasa University. He has been awarded the Doctor of Science, DSC, from S. Vyasa University. For his contributions to yoga research, he has 27 years of academic research and administrative experience, has published 80 research papers in indexed journals, international bibliographic databases. His research interests include psychophysiology of yoga, neural correlates of meditation, aging and rehabilitation. He has guided several students for research. He is also the editor of International Journal of Yoga and a reviewer of various international journals. Dr. Manjunath has delivered lectures on evidence-based yoga therapy and conducted workshops at prestigious institutions and universities across the world, including Harvard Medical School, Monash University, Australia, Royal College of Medicine, London, Shanghai University of Sports, China, Parma University, Italy, etc. He is the Vice President of Vivekananda Yoga University, California, USA, the Vice President of Asian Yoga Therapy Association, Singapore and the founding director of the global chain of integrative medicine clinics and hospitals with the brand name Vivekananda Health Global. I invite you Dr. Manjunath Nandi Krishnamurti ji for your talk on healthy aging through yoga and Ayurveda based lifestyle. Thank you madam. Nidaye Sarva Vidyana, Vishaji Bavaroginam, Gurave Sarva Lokam, Dakshina Murthy Namaha. I offer my salutations to all those uh, amazing, uh, knowledgeable people who are uh, assembled here today. And uh, take this opportunity to thank the all the uh, members of the organizing committee because of which I am uh, going to share some information about uh, my work and our institutional work on. Uh, the use of yoga and uh, in selected manner Ayurveda in the management of uh, uh, health issues related to geriatric population and also going to talk something about uh, healthy aging. I'm going to just share my slides. My slides visible, madam? Can you see my slides? Yes, we can see, sir. Thank you. Uh, of course, uh, when uh, the first invitation came, uh, I was just thinking, uh, what can be most appropriate for the session which is going on and uh, then what comprises of all that whatever has been included as part of uh, lifestyle has been brought in through 
the combination of uh, yoga and ayurveda in uh, uh, creating a wonderful thing what each one of us aspire for which is healthy aging we know it very well that uh, uh, aging is a natural consequence it is predictable because we all know that we are all going to get old one fine day it is inevitable because none of us can stop it it is progressive because uh, it is one directional and uh, only choice given to us is uh, it is as a variable experience what an individual can get old versus another individual can be different hence the choice is there and what methods which can help us do that is important uh, probably uh, old age is the only thing uh, that can comes to us without any effort or uh, any investment if you look at the population aging uh, it is very alarming uh, by 2050 it was uh, predicted that uh, there are several countries where you can see here the dark blue uh, um, dark blue images which all of them are going to have more than 30% or uh, more than 30% of individuals above 60 years of age and uh, more alarming is uh, the remaining part for example like the remaining uh, lighter blue shade which talks about uh, more than 10% and uh, less than 30% of the population getting older remaining a very small portion which is gray in nature uh, which probably has uh, some time to recover but uh, we need to really take care of uh, this whole aspect the demography talks about the population pyramid uh, if you look at india it is uh, equally proportionate when you look at a male and female and uh, both are aging and the population of aged aged individuals is significantly increasing even in india the demographic trends uh, have been contributed by three major uh, uh, factors one is a decreased fertility rate second is improved uh, healthcare uh, system and uh, of course along with that the third one increased life expectancy all these three things are probably uh, the major contributors uh, resulting in one fine day we are ha we having more number of elderly people becoming burden to the younger generation and uh, it is high time for us to really work on take care of this if you look at the component of healthy aging we can define it as a, a, a state where uh, it is uh, featured by low risk and high functional capacity so we know that uh, when we have low probability of disease and disease related disability along with that when we have a high capacity for cognitive and physical functioning with active engagement of uh, life including interpersonal relationship we can call ourselves as leading towards healthy aging lifestyle there are several components connected uh, with it there are two terminologies which are uh, very prominent pathogenesis we all know cellotogenesis is what has been uh, taking the center stage today because of various dimensions of lifestyle which all of them uh, can act as a factor for cellotogenesis cellotogenesis is uh, that uh, terminology which helps us understand health while pathogenesis helps us understand the disease process we can see as part of lifestyle mental health nutrition health hab healthy habits social harmony healthy relationships and spiritual health along with most important physical activity uh, have been put together as a package to understand as well as to maintain a good uh, healthy lifestyle when we bring yoga and ayurveda together we have lots of commonalities and lots to complement each other so the uh, main thing whatever we heard just now i am not going to uh, talk much about ayurveda we had a wonderful uh, uh, talk by dr uh, narayanan so uh, who has touched upon all these uh, uh, two major component of course one is the swastha vrutta because yoga we also bring it very close to Uh, the understanding of ayurveda when we talk about preventive health care preventive health care is where we uh, bring the focus on uh, various uh, regimens which includes uh, dinacharya and ruticharya and of course well elaborated by dr narayanan on sadhrutta and uh, along with that uh, there are uh, other modalities used in uh, maintaining uh, healthy aging uh, particularly uh, in one of the major study Uh, we have uh, looked at uh, rasayana which is the major uh, uh, prescription for uh, maintaining uh, health in the elderly 
and of course various uh, modalities of panchakarma and the major culprit uh, being uh, uh, pragnaparada when you look at uh, uh, yoga we bring uh, various dimensions for preventive health care number one is the ashtanga yoga uh, which is uh, uh, given as a compilation by uh, uh, sage patanjali which uh, starts from the basic code of conduct like yamas and niyamas uh, there are similarities that's what i said and complementary things between ayurveda and this when you talk of either sadhrutta yamas and niyamas and various other dimensions asana pranayama adds huge amount of uh, uh, um, uh, adaptability when you talk of physical activity while meditation and various other dimensions of yoga adds value uh, when you talk of mental health uh, there are combinations of them like uh, other streams of yoga like bhakti yoga karma yoga and nana yoga which all of them give uh, various dimensions of lifestyle which are essential for us to really cultivate and uh, adapt into your life uh, yogic diet a uh, lot of discussion has gone in uh, about the diet just now while uh, yogic diet plays uh, a major role if we can understand in a very simple way we had the discussion on sattvic diet while rajasik and tamasik have been put as culprits but it is very essential to understand diet plays a important role and we need all uh, different types of diet to manage our requirements it's not that you avoid one and have only one but it is very essential to really cater to the requirements of an individual as we talk of pragnaparada in ayurveda we have in yoga the component of adija vyadi so when we bring taitriya upanishad as the uh, base talk about panchakoshas as uh, an individual existential uh, 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 feature the problem starting from the mind percolating into the body resulting in a health problem uh, has been put under adija vyadi so there are uh, various components and principles we take uh, in taking this forward as uh, towards healthy aging let us look at uh, various uh, uh, issues connected with uh, aging individuals so i have picked selected number of them while there are several others uh, which uh, can be brought under this category uh, number one is gait and balance second sleep and depression arthritis and cognition uh, when you pick only yoga we have little more than 1000 plus articles uh, in pubmed uh, looking at uh, the influence or impact of yoga on various dimensions mentioned over here but when you look at ayurveda there are good number of other publications it can be either on drug uh, individual drugs or it can be combination of uh, ayurvedic practices uh, let me uh, go little into the details of these uh, selected ones uh, gait and balance as we all know uh, gait and balance plays an important role uh, in uh, uh, maintaining an individual's uh, uh, ability to walk and avoid falls so immobility is a common feature what we see in the elderly once uh, they have an issue with gait and balance and uh, they fall and the two systems contribute to it musculoskeletal as well as nervous system and we know that aging process can influence both of them both musculoskeletal and nervous system we have enough evidence to demonstrate yoga can probably reverse this if we can start practicing little earlier not just starting after you start having the problem and uh, there are good number of publications to talk about prevention of falls uh, which is a major concern through the practice of uh, yoga so uh, there were a couple of studies uh, one of it uh, is from our own institution where we saw selected balancing postures along with loosening and strengthening practices uh, improving the various dimensions of gait and balance for example like ability to get up from a uh, seated chair without arms and uh, walk initiate a quick walk with long steps and speed of improved speed of walking and ability to balance so uh, this is not just limited to one particular style uh, there are several styles of yoga which have been used for improving gait and balance i have just uh, brought in some of these taken from the publications uh, in akeshvyasa and many other organizations across the world they use yoga as an integrated approach which includes uh, asana pranayama meditation then of course relaxation techniques along with couple of, couple of other techniques 
Whereas uh, there were other publications looking at how Iyengar yoga can be used with some props, etc., to improve gait and balance. And mindfulness is becoming very popular and it has shown excellent uh, uh, improvement in gait and balance. Uh, Isha yoga from uh, Isha, uh, 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 I mean, taken from uh, the great uh, uh, preachings of Sadhguru, uh, has also been studied scientifically to demonstrate its uh, positive benefits and relaxation response along with exercise has also shown good results in uh, improving gait and balance. Uh, similar one along with gait and balance uh, connected with musculoskeletal system is uh, uh, arthritis in the elderly. The older people uh, most often suffer from osteoarthritis and uh, while it is not limited to osteoarthritis, in other cases we can also see rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, we know very clearly that uh, it is more predominant in the elderly, the osteoarthritis. And this starts uh, when uh, tissue ca uh, cartilage gets damaged and joint uh, starts uh, facing wear and tear mechanism. Of course, these are just uh, indications. And this study particularly looked at <clears throat> how uh, yoga can help in improving the hand grip strength, particularly looking at the muscle strength of smaller muscles of uh, uh, the uh, hand and uh, how it can reduce pain and improve mobility in individuals suffering from arthritis. And uh, there's one uh, uh, publication, old one, published in British Journal of Rheumatology from our institution, talking about uh, various dimensions of quality of life associated with that improving with yoga. And uh, there's another recent study looking at quality of life uh, in patients with osteoarthritis. And this study also looked at how uh, it can uh, help in, in improving the uh, activities of daily living, which is very essential in the elderly. So various techniques have been uh, looked upon. So in these studies, they have picked uh, simple joint loosening exercises called Sushma Vyayama and chair-based Surya Namaskar. This is a new adoptive technique for uh, people who are not able to do Surya Namaskar, guided relaxation, and in particular, right nostril breathing. We know there is right nostril, left nostril, alternate nostril breathing. In this inflammatory condition, for uh, when you look at pain relief, probably selective studies are uh, uh, supporting right nostril breathing along with other yoga practices. So uh, these studies have suggested it can reduce pain and stiffness on one side, and it can uh, help sedentary individuals with arthritis to uh, actually get into physical activity in a safer manner and improve physical and psychological health. Uh, the th third condition which is really troublesome in the elderly is depression. And uh, what yoga can bring in to these individuals include socialization, particularly when we bring yoga as a group practice, not as an individual practice. We have to encourage people because one of the study where I was involved, uh, I conducted it in an old age home. So we tried both, like uh, giving yoga uh, for few individuals as uh, individual uh, sessions, as well as giving it as a group session. The individuals who practiced it as a group session had an excellent uh, uh, recovery from depression compared to those who did it as an in, uh, individual practice, though they had a good uh, 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 development with respect to managing depression. So what we have seen is dynamic yoga practices can help elderly, but there are limitations like uh, what kind of practices can we give as dynamic in the elderly? They have lots of limitations, but chair based few dynamic exercises and uh, few breathing based dynamic exercises, etc. can benefit, but we have to be very careful. They might have lots of other uh, comorbid conditions, including hypertension to several other cases. And uh, we have to design it in such a way that we take care of other comorbid conditions as well. Something interesting uh, when I was teaching yoga to these uh, individuals, uh, what they also started liking was uh, bhakti yoga, the components of uh, bhakti yoga, which is also used in the West as kirtan yoga. Uh, uh, they started getting uh, engrossed into that component of uh, chanting and uh, uh, using uh, chanting as a means of regulating their breathing. And of course, lectures on philosophy of yoga were also very helpful for them to understand the meaning of life. 
And uh, it, this study demonstrated that we can significantly decrease uh, depression scores, improve positive approach to life, uh, along with improved coping abilities in these individuals. Uh, various styles, once again, for depression have been studied along with the uh, integrated approach, Sudarshan Kriya Yoga of uh, Art of Living uh, Foundation's uh, uh, technique, along with Sahaja Yoga, Mindfulness and Kirtan Yoga have been shown to be highly beneficial for managing depression in the elderly. Uh, the fourth condition is sleep disorders or uh, uh, issues connected with sleep. As we know, elderly spend more time in the bed than sleeping and uh, they have both uh, quality and quantity of sleep uh, compromised uh, due to several reasons. Either it is because of uh, pre-existing medical conditions or uh, other issues connected with their psychological health. We also know that um, uh, it can also be because of the neurodegeneration and connected uh, uh, issues. So yoga has been shown to improve uh, the time taken to fall asleep because the main issue in them is they go to bed it takes minimum of around 45 minutes to one hour to get into sleep so when uh, they practiced yoga and we also developed a small snippet of practice before going to bed for them and uh, that has really uh, made them probably uh, get into sleep much earlier than the previous experience and number of hours slept and feeling of being rested in the morning along with number of awakenings in the night have significantly reduced. And the final uh, important area of interest is uh, uh, memory because uh, this is where we look at uh, uh, the ability to remember and forget as the best gift bestowed on us. Imagine any one of them are not working well, either to remember or to forget. Both of them can be very troublesome and uh, aging uh, associated uh, cognitive decline is very well known and it can lead to dementia and one of the condition which is very well known for introducing this is Alzheimer's disease. So uh, we know it very well that lots of things happen in dementia. Uh, one of the main issue is uh, loss of cognitive functioning. Uh, so this includes uh, uh, thinking, reasoning and behavioral abilities and uh, imagine many times doctors advise you have to uh, remember the seven warning signs of forgetfulness. If they have the ability to remember, then they don't have the forgetfulness. Hence, uh, we need to strategize differently to make them understand. In yoga, we talk about uh, uh, memory as uh, smruti. So, anubhuta vishayasam pramoshaha smrutihi is what is def defined as. And one of the major contribution to this uh, disturbed or uh, decline in cognitive functions can be probably it was very well explained in Bhagavad Gita which talks about uh, one particular shloka summarizes everything dhyayato vishyan pumsa sangaste shupa jayate sangat sanjayate kamaha kamat krodho vijayate etc etc so this says very clearly that uh, it's all to do with the mind and you get entangled with your thinking and you get stuck with that and you are not able to come out of it and that results in series of issues including uh, loss of memory and uh, also losing a lot of issues. So these are uh, selective studies su uh, supporting the use of yoga in the management of uh, improving memory or improving uh, brain functions. So uh, there are a good number of studies we had taken up, some on evoke potentials, some on imaging, both talking about when you do yoga practices, be it pranayama or meditation, uh, the results put here are uh, from our neuroimaging studies on meditation, talking about how the practice of yoga can activate those areas of the brain in the frontal lobe, which are all connected with attentional processes particularly as you can see here, anterior cingulate, dorsolateral, prefrontal cortex and regions of limbic system, all of them have been shown to improve. Along with that, there is a, there is a good amount of inhibitory response in the brain. Uh, the disturbing and uh, the diverting uh, areas uh, probably can be very well regulated through the practice of yoga. And there is uh, uh, there are several studies now talking not just the uh, functional plasticity, but also structural plasticity is possible through the practice of yoga. Increased cortical thickness has been noticed in the similar areas which regulate attentional processes. 
and this is uh, another study once again uh, uh, focusing on that apart from uh, its impact on the brain yoga has also been shown its impact on uh, various other dimensions including uh, those which regulate aging process one of it is uh, uh, the uh, <clears throat> particularly looking at uh, the telomere length and telomerase activity and uh, this particular study spoke about uh, the role of telomerase activity and its association with uh, changes in lifestyle and uh, this study on meditation demonstrating increased telomerase activity and also increased uh, perceived control and neuroticism along with better mindfulness in the people who practiced yoga this is the summary of it how yoga can help in uh, successful aging uh, one way connected with the autonomic functions on the other way connected with uh, uh, hpa axis on the third way connected with the immune mechanism and on the fourth way uh, connected directly with the me uh, underlying mechanisms of aging so this is uh, the summary if you pick the longest lived individuals in the world probably these are the three which are very pro prominently seen uh, in the uh, media so there is one from japan italy and united states in the central part if you look uh, what is most common amongst all these people so all of them were very well connected with uh, their families uh, they had very good uh, control of uh, their uh, uh, habits then uh, they were all on plant based diet and they had constant moderate physical activity and they had very good social engagement probably this suggests that lifestyle has a big uh, role to play and uh, uh, this probably also can summarize our uh, mindset like uh, we want what we uh, uh, don't have and uh, at the same time we don't respect and enjoy what we have we want always that change this is just for the interest of people uh, some of the practices i have put here joint loosening how you can do these practices using a chair etc and also how you can maintain your uh, spinal health in the elderly simple uh, practices and twisting based practices and supine and prone positions etc along with that if you can add uh, meditation pranayama like guided imagery can help in many individuals to divert their attention and bring in breath awareness and chanting as part of it and of course hundred types of meditation it is always said that whatever suits you you do it don't ask which meditation should i do you can try a couple of them but probably the best ones would be where you can also regulate your breathing because that's the way, easiest way to so uh, since diet has been touched upon i just uh, brought in only three co components of diet sattvic diet of course uh, the discussion can go on whether plant based uh, whether it is uh, common etc uh, what is said is seasonal and regional food and reduced sugar and carbohydrate probably this is the fundamental uh, uh, importance if we have the capacity whatever we eat it body can digest it but we don't do physical activity we don't take care of all other things but we only debate on consumption of food and then not uh, uh, digesting it so there is nothing wrong in uh, reducing uh, certain things and of course consumption of uh, lots of liquids particularly water and uh, maintain the sleep hygiene and sleep discipline and incorporate the four paths of yoga karma yoga gnana yoga raj yoga and bhakti yoga along with the one hour whatever you bring in asana pranayama meditation and relaxation so when the whole world can uh, follow this i think we need to do it in, since uh, yoga brings in a self imposed lifestyle modification which is featured by physical activity slow deep breathing healthy diet diet habits relaxation positive mental attitude and philosophy of life because it is very well said in bhagavad gita your worries are unnecessary your death is unavoidable the soul is indestructible and immortal this is the truth and we need to just follow that so uh, wishing everybody to age gracefully and bring in various dimensions of uh, yoga and more spoken on ayurveda i am sure i don't need to detail all them thank you very much are they being now brought into practice for instance uh, things it was mentioned there are integrative centers now i think uh, 
uh, Dr. Ramaji had mentioned in the morning, how uh, in AIMS. Now, our, uh, when patients go there, say somebody says, I've got blood pressure, somebody says, I've got sugar, you know, non communicable disease, etc. Are the doctors also now recommending that uh, yoga practices or Ayurveda practices uh, be adopted along with, uh, you know, whatever uh, uh, treatment they are uh, getting? I think uh, Dr. Rama will be the right person to answer, but uh, I always, uh, uh, I have seen uh, both in India and outside India, it is coming into practice. So because uh, several of the uh, departments doing uh, yoga research, that is resulting in them understanding the value of yoga and then bringing it to into their recommendation for patients. Yoga as an adjuvant therapy, certainly yes. So I think there's a lot of research interest and uh, generating evidence, uh, uh, you know, in uh, yoga and uh, Ayurveda, definitely in Yen's uh, uh, Ayurveda, there is no department of Ayurveda as such. So uh, the doctors cannot recommend Ayurveda. They do not as well. And uh, uh, there are uh, certain uh, de clinical departments where yoga is being used as an adjuvant therapy. And there's a lot of uh, work, uh, research work going on. So, but, you know, I mean, now I think as far as yoga is concerned, uh, there are enough evidences that it is uh, 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 very effective. And so we need to draw a line as to when to stop and get it into routine practice so that patients benefit because there is no uh, end to researches and publications, right? Yes. There are 1001 diseases which can be studied in so many, using so many yoga postures, you know, there's no end to it. So the patients have to benefit. Yes, there was initially there were results observations as to whether it actually causes, uh, uh, you know, brings about the changes uh, uh, we claim to. And now it is amply clear. So what should be done is that it has to be uh, quickly integrated into the clinical practice and the data documented. So I think uh, it's time to draw a line because there is a lot of uh, money, public money, which is uh, spent on research. You know, research also is very, very costly. And uh, I think uh, we need to use the public money with a lot of responsibility. And uh, so is the case with Ayurveda as well. Uh, of course, there is a big difference between Ayurveda and yoga in the sense that uh, yoga is, uh, you know, uh, non-pharmaceutical. So it is very easy for the allopathic uh, uh, fraternity to accept uh, yoga. And the added incentive is that the West has endorsed it. So if the West endorses it, then, you know, it becomes easy for Indians to believe it as well. Uh, as far as Ayurveda is concerned, it's much more trickier because it needs to compete with the pharmaceutical, uh, uh, you know, uh, the pharmaceutical companies, which is not easy. So Ayurveda, I think it has to be a lot of thought has to go into uh, how what exactly to do or how exactly to move forward uh, with Ayurveda, right? Uh, again, you know, with Ayurveda also, there are uh, there, there won't be any end to research in Ayurveda. There are over nearly one lakh formulations which are documented in Ayurvedic classical text. So are we going to check out all these one lakh doc, uh, the formulations? Even if we do research, check out 100 formulations, it will be a huge amount of money. And uh, that it's like a ticking time bomb now, you know. I mean, uh, there is hardly anybody who can be called healthy. So when do we decide that the public is going to benefit from this knowledge? So I think there is a lot of uh, thought that has to go in, in my opinion. Thank you, Babaji. Are you back? Yeah, we are back. Mm -hmm. And the time for the next session, it is right now. 440. We go on to the next session. Can you hear me, please? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, madam. So now this is the sec session four for today. And we have the speaker, Dr. Ram Kumar Kutti, founder director Vaidya Gram Koyambatur, Tamil Nadu. His title is Is Ayurveda Nature Center Today? 
आई एल इंट्रोड्यूस हिम ब्रीफली डॉक्टर राम कुमार इज द फाउंडर एंड डिरेक्टर ऑफ पुनर्नवा आयुर्वेद अ वेरी मीनिंगफुल टर्म ए कंपनी कमिटेड टू वर्ड्स प्रमोटिंग वेलबींग विद ऑथेंटिक आयुर्वेद डॉक्टर कुट्टी कंप्लीटेड इज फॉर्मल एजुकेशन इन आयुर्वेद इन नाइनटीन नाइन्टी वन एंड वेंट ऑन टू वर्क ऑन अ प्रोजेक्ट एम्ड एट इम्प्रूविंग द हेल्थ केयर सिस्टम इन इंडिया फ्रॉम नाइन्टी फोर टू टू थाउजेंड थ्री He was one of the trustees at the Ayurvedic Trust Hospital in Coimbatore, India, recognized by the government of India as one of the top five Ayurvedic hospitals in India. So I invite you, Dr. Ram Kumar Putti, for your presentation, please. You have thirty minutes for presentation and ten minutes for discussion. Uh, namaste. i hope i am audible yes you are yes yes okay. thank you i think we are in the summer part of the day where this conference is concerned so the systems are going off we are getting cut off but uh, it's been rather interesting to listen to many of the experts the academicians the researchers the clinicians uh i must say that i am a student so i i need to put that on on the table right at the beginning i have remained a student and have none of the level of expertise that we heard through the day and as i heard some of the sessions i thought that a lot of what i intended to speak about has already been covered so what i am going to do is go back to the basics and try to understand a few definitions or remember a few definitions in english of words like cure and heal and holistic and natural and then see how you know we can apply it practically in the context of ayurveda so to to begin with the first and the, and the foremost is what is the difference between curing and healing curing in simple terms means the elimination of all disease and healing means becoming whole if healing means becoming whole then the next question is what is holistic or, or, or you know a little more elaborate understanding of what healing is healing is defined as a holistic transformative process of repair and recovery in mind body and spirit resulting in positive change finding meaning and movement towards self realization of wholeness regardless of the presence or absence of disease so now the word whole is becoming a lot more important and um, so i was looking at the definition of holistic medicine from a paper that it was written in in the 1980s and that paper said holistic medicine is an attitudinal approach to health care rather than a particular set of techniques it addresses the psych psychological the familial the societal the ethical the spiritual as well as the biological dimensions of health and illness the holistic approach emphasizes the uniqueness of each patient the mutuality of the doctor patient relationship each person's responsibility for his or her own health care and society's responsibility for the promotion of health where does this word holistic medicine come from 
I believe it was first written in the 1920s in a book called Holism and Evolution, where holism was an antidote to the analytic reductionism of contemporary science. And its priority was an insistence that each patient be understood and treated as a unique individual made up of body, mind, and spirit, and that any healthcare must also take into account a person's environment. I repeat, any healthcare must also take into account a person's environment. So there is a lot that has been spoken about holistic medicine in, from this perspective, but I must again reiterate another sentence which says holistic medicine emphasizes the potential therapeutic value of the setting in which healthcare takes place and of the psychosocial support it makes available. An understanding and a commitment to change those social and economic conditions that perpetuate ill health are an integral part of the holistic approach to medicine and are a necessary counterbalance to its emphasis on individual responsibility. Finally, holistic medicine is as concerned with changing the attitude of the physicians who practice medicine as with broadening and enriching the medical practice. I think that's quite a lot. And as time went by, this is from the 80s or from the 1920s, in the 2000s, we have had two important concepts coming from the West. One is called an optimum healing environment. And the second is called healing. Um, the second one is called hope or healing oriented practices and environment. So optimum healing environment and healing oriented practices and environment, both coming from the West. The second is hardly in the last decade or so, it was applied primarily for veterans healthcare in the West and has significantly contributed to reducing the burden of healthcare for the veterans in America. The optimum healing environment is also a very interesting concept, though, unfortunately, I don't think it uh, caught on as much as it should have. It talks about four components of the healing process. One is the internal component, where the focus is on healing intention and personal wholeness. The second is the interpersonal uh, component, where we are talking about healing relationships between doctor and patient, between um, patient and nurse, between sorry, between patient and nurse, between the patient and the family, between the patient and the disease, the patient and the food. There are so many relationships that need to be considered. Healing organizations also come in here between the patient and the healing space where the patient is being healed. That is a very important relationship. The third is behavioral components talking about healthy lifestyles and integrative care. And the fourth is external component, where we are talking about healing spaces, working with nature, being a part of nature, allowing the patient to view nature. Eco ecological resilience is also a part of it. So this was a very in interesting construct in the first decade of the 2000s, um, I don't think it really caught on. But reading all of this is what made a few of us think, isn't, that, isn't this what 
Ayurveda is all about. This and a lot more. The whole concept of Ayurveda, again, when we look at the definition of health, as told by Sushruta, Samadosha Samagdhishya Samadhatu Malakriya Prasannatmi Indriya Mana Swastha Iti Abhidiyate. I'm sure it must have been discussed today. When we look at these definitions in our classical texts, it covers all of this and a lot more. And then, you know, a few of us, Vaidyas, in the early 2000s, we thought we need to get together and see how to make this a reality. Because, you know, I, I heard earlier a question about how is all of, how can all of this be made practical? And that was a question that has been there in most of the community, whether it's the Ayurveda community, whether it's the yoga community, how can we make many of these concepts actually a reality in healing and living? So we started doing our homework. We said we want to do it as close to what the texts say. We realized that there is very little information about creating a healing space in the text. Probably Charakas in the 15th chapter of the Sutrasthana talks about creating a Panchakarma facility for a king. There is also the facility um, to create a Rasayana Chigilsa, Kuti Praveshika Rasayana Chigilsa. There's a detailed description of how to create a Kuti for an intensive rejuvenative process. And there is also probably a description of how to create a delivery home. Apart from this, we don't see too much description in the Ayurveda text about creating healing spaces. And so we depended on what Charaka says for the king. And it's a very interesting concept where he talks extensively about the space being very carefully selected based on the principles of Vastu or Indian Feng Shui or Sapatya Veda ensuring the dimensions and directions are completely in keeping with the principles of Vastu. He also talks about all the equipment, all the vessels, everything that needs to be put together. He says that only people who are dear to the patient should be in the vicinity. That is, there should not be anybody who's speaking badly to the patient or thinking badly of the patient or not desiring the healing to happen. The, the interpersonal relationships have to be very loving and caring and healing. He talks about the need to have uh, animals in the vicinity, some deer, some birds, pleasant sights in the vicinity. He talks about music, having good therapeutic, healing, classical music playing, which will also contribute to the healing process, and so on. So we said, why don't we attempt to create such a space at a time when a lot of the Ayurveda healing spaces were being constructed on the basis of modern concepts, following, following the modern hospital concepts. So we went into the villages, we found a space where the surrounding community was also happy to uh, participate with us in creating the space. It was a land where nothing has, had grown for seven years. So it was almost a virgin piece of land, no water, no trees, no grass, no herbs, nothing was there. And we took this land and started working with it intensely. We started looking at rainwater harvesting, how to use the local soil to create the healing space, how to avoid air conditioning and television and internet and Wi-Fi in a healing space, to enhance the healing um, journey. 
we looked at how we can grow our own food and our own herbs and bring back bring back the flora and fauna that was missing in this space for many many years so the creation of the space was completely based on vastu dimensions and directions over a period of time this space is now home to more than 60 species of birds more than 100 species of different kinds of herbs a lot of food is being grown in the in the same space and most importantly the surrounding community is a part of the healing process here the villagers there are it's a panchayat where there are 15 villages and 12000 people it was quite an impoverished panchayat with a lot of malnutrition and associated diseases now more than 200 of this this panchayat 200 people from this panchayat are a part of the healing process they work here they go back they share a lot of information with the community the surrounding area and gradually the entire community not just the healing space but the entire panchayat is moving in the direction of working with nature or harnessing the potential of nature to heal themselves and to live well. It is important to, to understand here that this is a highly collaborative effort. When we talk about being holistic, it has to extend in all directions. It has to extend, not, it's, it's not just about being holistic internally. It is about being holistic externally. It is about how we work with the soil, how we work with the waste management, the water management, the um, uh, rainwater harvesting, the food management, the people management, the space management, the time management, if all of these concepts can be integrated into the healing process and we're actually able to apply the Yukti Vipashya, Sattva Vajaya and Deva Vipashya, which some people translate as rational treatment, spiritual treatment and ritualistic treatment, may not be wholly accurate, the English translations. But if this entire range of treatments can be brought into a healing space that is set up with the intention of being holistic, there is no reason why we cannot get a different level of results without having to actually invest considerably in trying to validate what is already told in the text, as Dr. Rama said earlier, the, the kind of effort and time and funds that, get, that need to go into that process can sometimes be better applied in creating multiple integrated healing spaces across the country using the local natural resources, making our own decoctions and kadas and kashayams freshly, making it completely plastic free and, and um, uh, chemical free, isolated chemical free, trying to be as natural in the process as possible. I think the sky is the limit for the application of Ayurveda in reducing the global burden of healthcare. Yes, research is required, documentation is required, validation is required. But first, it is important 
to work at the ground level to create spaces and to create clinicians, expert clinicians who can utilize these spaces and bring out the holism of Ayurveda in its true to, to its maximum potential. And then working with the documentation makes probably a little more sense to a to a person like me who is not an academician or a researcher and is only a part-time clinician. We started with two rooms on three acres of land with no funds in our pocket. Today we have grown to 48 rooms on 40 acres of land with patients coming for management of an entire range of health issues from all over the world. And we had a scientist from Harvard who came in and said, after a couple of weeks, he had been monitoring himself using some gadgets. And he said that on every parameter that he was monitoring, he was doing much better. And now he is planning to set up a documentation process where his team will document not just the patients in this healing space, but also the larger community who are in the space, trying to understand how being a part of nature can itself be highly healing. During the COVID period, this was a space because there is no air conditioning, everything is well ventilated, everything is open. We continued to function through the entire COVID period. And because it was an open space, it was, you know, social distancing and Everything happened naturally. Everybody was drinking kashayams. Everybody was doing nasyams. And through much of the first phase of COVID, this place almost functioned like a bubble. Not just this place, we are talking about the extended community, including some of the villages in the surrounding area. When we talk of nature-centered treatment, we can think of the internal nature, we can think of the external nature, we can think of what the external nature has to offer for the internal nature to heal well. There are many different ways in which we can think of nature-centered treatment. Practically, we have to make it happen. We have to move out of plastic bottles. We have to move out of preservatives that are going into these bottles, into the Ayurveda medicines. We have to find solutions where we are able to unleash the full holistic potential of not just Ayurveda in isolation, but Ayurveda in association with other parts of the Indian knowledge systems. Ayurveda with Vastu Shastra, Ayurveda with Jyotish, Ayurveda with Yoga. There are so many different parts of Indian knowledge systems. If all of them come together and work in specially designed healing spaces across the length and breadth of the country, and then we look at documentation, validation, etc. I think we will be doing a tremendous contribution in reducing the global burden or global cost of healthcare. The whole world is looking to India. The whole world is looking to Ayurveda and other complementary and, of course, today it's called complementary and integrative medicine, whatever we call it, uh, traditional systems, complementary systems, whatever we choose to call it, there is a huge 
ailing population as we all know the ncd population of the world today is contributing more than 70% to death and disability worldwide we have to move fast i think this summit this conference is so important in trying to put forward the need to work at a practical level while continuing the work at academic research levels at a practical level going out into nature creating these healing spaces creating the the experts who can use this these healing spaces well and thereby look after the global ailing community i think uh, i should uh, stop here uh, it's a it's a, been a long day for everybody and uh, uh, so i will stop here if there are any questions i'm willing to take it but otherwise thank you so much for this opportunity to share namaste thank you thank you dr kutti for this amazing presentation which was an eye opener for all of us because all of that we are discussing we are reading that's all theory but you have made it happen nature center treatment and the story is so inspiring that you have narrated i'm feeling goosebumps actually very very well presented i think there may be many more questions this is although this is a theoretical question but i would like to ask you how would you translate these three terms yukti vyapashraya tattva vajaya and daiva vyapashraya because we only read through the books but you have some novel ideas please well um, like i said earlier it is generally translated as rational or logical treatment uh, which is using the yukti uh, and that is primarily for the body then we have sattva vajaya which is basically to improve the sattva to improve the the the, the conviction the faith the determination the will power to go through the healing process and be he um it is sometimes translated as spiritual treatment um it can be anything it can be chanting it can be mantras it can be counseling it can be just talking to the uh, the the patient anything that strengthens the mind and then there is deva vipashya which is more for the uh, it's 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 sometimes termed as ritualistic treatment it is more to um, reduce the impact of past karmas or to minimize the impact of past karmas which cannot be minim that which cannot be minimized by just herbs and uh, treatments so here that is where some of these pujas and havans and homas come into play uh that is where astrology can contribute significantly vedic astrology medical astrology if used well uh we do realize that some of the knowledge systems are used casually or trivially and thereby you know we don't get the best benefits but where jyotish or vastu are used well it can significantly contribute to the healing paradigm so we have attempted and we continue to attempt to use all of this in our facility and we have seen uh, a lot of benefit using all of these different modalities thank you thank you so much for clarifying so please the floor is now open for discussion questions comments or queries रोहित कृष्णा से किसी को किसका हाथ रमा जी रमा जय सुंदर डॉक्टर रमा जय सुंदर या 
I just want to congratulate uh, Dr. Ram Kumar Kuti for his wonderful. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yes. Yeah. Now I just want to congratulate uh, Dr. Ram Kumar Kuti for his wonderful presentation, and I completely agree with him that the uh, one need to unleash the full potential of Ayurveda. And uh, the, the priority should be training quality doctors as one who has been, you know, working in very, very close association with uh, uh, our Ayurvedic practitioners and also researchers in Ayurveda. Uh, definitely, you know, I mean, research, nobody uh, has any second opinion about documentation and research. But uh, what is the point of uh, research if there are uh, no doctors to deliver? So there is a, a dearth of uh, quality Ayurvedic doctors and it's very, very imperative and very, very important that uh, the training uh, should be given the first priority. And then the rest of the things can follow. So I am in 200% agreement with uh, uh, what uh, Dr. Uh, Ramkumar had said. And I would once again like to congratulate him for his wonderful presentation. And I learned a lot from your presentation. Thank you so much. Rohit, you have a question, please, or comment? Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, uh, sir, you mentioned about uh, reducing the usage of plastics and uh, uh, reducing the num uh, amount of preservatives that uh, we have in the uh, Ayurvedic medicines, which will, which might reduce its eff efficacy as well, which is in another way to reduce the pharmacy-based system that we are following on in the, uh, the, uh, the medical field at larger and in our context Ayurveda. Sir, earlier I have heard that in the past generations, uh, there was another model where Vaidyas used to come to the house of the patients and treat the patients at their individual houses they prepare medicines coming to their house so the medicines are not pre prepared but rather coming to the houses and seeing the patients and based on that the the otherwise they will prepare the medicine in their own houses and they do it very ritualistically and in that process they might invite uh, you know jodishas and uh, uh, they do it in a very ritualistic way. So do you think such a decentralized model uh, should be adopted for coming years uh, in order to uh, make your idea practical? Uh, I, I definitely think, uh, you know, at some point, that is the direction in which we will need to move. If you look at Chinese medicine, even today, you can go to the United States into a Chinese medicine clinic and see rows of shelves filled with the herbs themselves. Mm. And the Chinese medicine practitioner will examine you and prescribe the herbs for you to take with you. If necessary, they will even, you know, tell you to buy an electric kettle in which you can brew the herbs and use it and, and make it for yourself every day at home. When, when we started with this idea of, you know, let us try to, you know, give the patients the herbs to make it at home when they go back, some of us were in a dilemma. We thought patients are not going to take that effort. But over the years, we see that more than 70% of our patients prefer to take the herbs and prepare it themselves at home and it is less than 30 percent who want to take the prepared bottled medicine and we tell them clearly this does contain you know sodium benzoate or whatever it is we tell them clearly that ideally we want you to you know make your herbs make your kashayam yourself but where you cannot please go in for the bottled medicine or the capsules or the tablets as they come these days. But we have to give the option to the patient. Today, in many contexts, the Ayurveda community is taking the decision on behalf of the patients. When we see the whole world, 
moving in a different direction abroad we have what is what are called permaculture communities communities where people co come together and live on 30 40 100 acres of land live completely off the land as much as they can except that they don't have ayurveda with them there are many such communities across europe america and australia where they grow their own food their own herbs they have their own animals everything is uh, self sustainable it is certainly possible to do that in india creating sustainable healing communities with a higher level of awareness where people within the community and those who come from outside the community try to align themselves as much as possible with the principles of ayurveda we have we have probably achieved only 5 to 10% of what is possible there is there is so much more that can be achieved if we are able to apply the principles in its entirety and every healing space growing its own herbs and food becomes an very important part of this process. Thank you, Dr. Kuti. Any more questions or comments? If not, then I would like to extend a very heartfelt thanks to the speaker to all the persons who have joined in this conference since morning, to Dr. Ram Manohar and Rohit for all the support, to the staff and ARO at IIAS and all the members sitting in the audience. Thank you so much, everybody. I think we had a very fruitful day and we enriched ourselves so much today with all these ideas and lectures. Tomorrow we shall meet at 9.45 and the session will be beginning with the talk of Dr. Ram Manohar himself and the theme will be Ayurveda and mental well-being. So please assemble here by 9.30. And those of you who are on joining online, please join by 9.40 latest. Thank you so much. Thanks again. Sapko Namaste.